excuse my mistakes as your advice on how far to keep the microphone from your mouth. My name is Nathan Crabb, and uh, some of you may know me as the former opinion editor of the Games Full Sun, and currently the editor of the Invading Sea, which is a climate journalism uh, website. Um, I work for Florida Atlantic University now, as my t-shirt shows, but stay working remotely here from uh, Gainesville, and, and that, that makes me really happy because it's a great community, as this event right here shows. Um, before we get into some of the event, let's go through some housekeeping items. Bathrooms out the back to the right, keep going if you're looking for those. Uh, internet access. I think Santa Fe has a guest account that if you put in your email address, you, you should be able to get. Uh, access to and having internet access for this event is important because we're going to be using something called the Mentimeter. The Mentimeter, it's a uh, handy dandy uh, high tech gadget that will allow us to um, ask questions, provide feedback, and all that good stuff. So, uh, check now to make sure you have internet access, and then um, Sadie here will be telling you a little bit more about that when the time comes about how to access that. But internet access now is the first thing we care about. Um, that's the housekeeping stuff. Um, I just want to say, you know, a lot has happened in the last few weeks. Um, and I'll tell all of you, um, you know, we've, we've been through some uh, hurricanes here, um, and all that comes with that. Um, we've been through an election, and uh, the people that I've talked with this morning, um, you know, I think a recurring theme is, is, is kind of um, having the blues maybe lately. Um, about some of the things that have been going on um, in our community and the world, but I think that if there's anything uh, uh, that's a cure for those blues, it's, it's seeing uh, all the great people that are here today uh, for this event. And, and I'm very thankful that uh, everyone came out for this and that I can be a part of it as well. Um, you know, and I just wanted to share one thing with you. Um, so the Invading Sea, as I said, is a climate journalism website that I edit now. Um, it's the invadingsea.com if you ever want to visit it, and you publish I know that you don't have an, a, an opinion page anywhere locally publishing op-eds for folks, but I'm still doing that um, on a statewide basis in the debating scene. So if any of you folks ever want to write about climate issues, I'm still happy to publish those pieces. And I actually send them around the state to other newspapers to publish them as well. So um, uh, stop by and chat with me if you're interested in that. But one of the things the debating scene is, is does is, is the center that I work for has done this climate survey that they do, they've done since 2019, they do it twice a year. Now we've named it the debating seas. Uh, Florida Climate Survey. I just wanted to share with you very briefly before I introduce our, our, our welcome. Just. You broke it, Nathan. I know. That's what happens when you let a newspaper person in charge of the talking. No, technology is a fickle mistress. Oh. Get a backup plan. It's going red here, so I don't know if that means no. Yeah, I'll take it. Juice. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. survey, and it was conducted in September of 1,400 Floridians, and here's some of what it found. 88% of Floridians agree that climate change is happening. I know that shouldn't be exciting news, that should be kind of a, a gimme at this point, but I just want you to know that that number is a bit larger than a lot of places in the country, and I think that's because of the lived experience of Floridians dealing with climate impacts. 75% uh, agree Florida sh should do more to de diversify its energy mix to include more electricity produced by renewable sources. And that's one that goes across party lines. Everyone thinks we should be using more solar and renewable energy, uh, or the vast majority do at least. 69% of Floridians believe climate science should be taught in K-12 schools. Let that one sink in with some of the things you might have read in the news. 67% agree the federal government should do more to address climate impacts, while 68% agree that the state should do more. Um, so you know, I just wanted to tell you these things because sometimes it's portrayed that, the, that much like every other issue, there's a lot of divisions, and I'm not trying to paper over those divisions. Certainly, this is a polarized issue like anything else we're dealing with in our, our modern world. But there is a lot of consensus on these issues as well, 
And you know, we didn't ask in that survey, we think the local governments should do more, but quite frankly, in the state of Florida, the local governments have where the action's been out of this issue. Southeast so Florida has had a climate compact, compact for a number of years, and I think you're going to see today that Alachua County is also a leader in this, so I'm very pleased we'll be able to talk about that more. So without further ado, let's introduce our first two speakers. Uh, first off, we have uh, Stephanie Washell. She's Santa Cate College's Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs. Among other duties, she serves as the Administrative Liaison for the College's Sustainability Committee. Under her leadership, the college is about to hire its first energy and sustainability manager to kick off the Net Zero mm -hmm. Waste Initiative. And also joining us is Chuck Chestnut, who is Chairman of the Alachua County Commissioner and Commissioner for District 5. Prior to being elected as County Commissioner, he was a Florida State Representative and a Gainesville City Commissioner. He's funeral director for Chestnut Funeral Home and licensed life insurance agent. Welcome to both of you. So, good morning. Uh, I, I can also use my, well, I used to call it my teacher voice, but now that my parents are elderly, I call it my mom and dad voice. Uh, I think you guys can relate to that. So, thank you for being here. On behalf of Dr. Paul Brody and Santa Fe College, I'm delighted to welcome you to the Blunt Center. When we built this building, our hope was that the community would utilize it. So it's really a delight to see you all here and utilizing this space for such very, very important work. Um, I was delighted to hear the results of the climate survey, the most recent climate survey, because I think it shows that people are finally becoming aware of the situation that we have at hand, particularly in the state of Florida, and uh, beginning to take the actions that we need to build resilient communities where everyone can thrive despite the climate challenges that we may be facing. So I thank you for this very, very important work that you're doing on behalf of the college, our community, and everyone in our lovely state. So we appreciate you being here, and please enjoy your day. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome everyone to the County Climate Summit and to the Santa Fe College Blunt Center. I would especially like to give special thanks to uh, President Brody and Dr. Walshall for allowing us to use this beautiful space. The goal of the event is to provide you with ideas of the county in approaching the challenges associated with climate change and to receive your uh, feedback and ideas that are used to finalize the climate action plan uh, with the goal of adopting uh, this plan in 2025. In 2023, the county mission identified three climate related strategic goals and to be more equitable and resilient community. There were the focus, I'm sorry, my eyesight is bit bad. The focus, the focus of, of this is community planning and growth and addressing climate change and community and environmental resiliency, creating a climate action plan and implementing a action plan recommendations and implementing and redefining and adopting energy, water, and environmental conservation, preservation, and plans to benefit all inhabitants and ensure activities are aligned with the Climate Action Plan. The Climate Summit today and the actions we take over the next year are going to help get us to these strategic goals. On behalf of the Lachlan County Board of County Commissioners, thank you again for attending, and I hope you enjoy this event. Again, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Say, do you want to come up here? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Thank <laughs> you. 
Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Wonderful. Thank you. My name is Sadie Mills, and I'm with the Thompson Earth Systems Institute, which is part of the Florida Museum at UF. And our mission is to communicate and educate about Earth system science, what we like to call air, water, land, and life for the environment, so Floridians can be more effective stewards of our planet. One of our mantras in the work that we do is to help Floridians understand what's going on, why it matters, and what they can do about it. And that's a process that you all are participating in here today. And our role here today is actually to help you then communicate back your thoughts, ideas, and questions about what's um, being talked about here today. And to do that, we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter. Um, so to access it, um, it requires a smartphone or a tablet. And you can use the QR code. Or if you're not a QR code post person, I'm going to move um, the slide over, and you'll see a web address you can access to. It doesn't require a login. Um, and you can use data or the internet um, to access it. And it will allow us to get feedback from you and get questions from you throughout. And if you don't have a smartphone today, we actually do have a paper option to ask questions as well. We have paper cards that are here at the front. And you can come up and get them, or I'm sure if you raise your hand, we can drop some off to you as well. So let me get this moved over so we can get started. And the QR code's on your agenda also. Good thing. It should go up there, just a little mm -hmm. green arrow, if that pops up, I think you're all set. You just wait, I think she'll... Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm giving everyone just a minute to join, um, and I'm going to go ahead and move to our first question, but you can still join at any point, even if I've moved on. And if you haven't had a chance to catch up, the um, QR code is on your agenda, and then the web address to join at the top will always be at the top. So we're going to get started by getting to know each other a little bit better, to know who's here today and what we're representing. So our first question, what is your most important reason for being here today? You probably have many reasons to be here today, but we're asking you to pick the most important one. It might be to share concerns about climate change, learn more about the Climate Action Plan, meet others who are concerned in network, and also learn how you can get involved. A lot of responses coming in, just making sure everyone has a chance. <laughs> Wonderful, okay. So the people are still chiming in, that's okay, but I think we can see our trend that you all are here to learn, and that's great, because I think we're going to be able to accomplish that goal today. Um, but for those of you who hope to meet others who are concerned, um, there will be some time in the breakout sessions to learn more about um, concerns that others have and why they're here. And hopefully you'll be able to learn why you can get involved too. Now before we move on to the next question, I also want to point out that you'll see at the bottom of your screen an option to ask a question. And that's open at any time today, so if you have a question, you can go ahead and add it, and we'll see it up here at the moderator's table, and we'll share it um, with the moderators, but if we don't get a chance to ask it, all questions are going to go to the planning team at the end of the day, so your question will get seen. So let's go to our next question. This one is a map, and you drop a little pin on the map to indicate where you're from, but let's see where we're from in Alachua County today. It's not going to be perfect. It's kind of hard to come on the screen, but we'll get a good idea. Got a lot of folks from right here in Gainesville, but it's great to see you. We have some folks joining us from Waldo and Archer. That's wonderful. And great for us to keep in mind today that there are lots of spots on the map without a dot, so some voices that aren't here in the room today, but might have some ideas too. All right. Next question. What perspectives are you here representing today? And you can pick more than one. You might be feeling concerns as a community leader. You might be feeling concerns as a business owner, as a parent, or someone who caretakes your parents a home or property owner, a resident, something else. This is 
really helpful for us to think about as we learn about these issues, knowing that there are lots of people concerned who still just go to. <laughs> well, we're troubleshooting. I'll do my best to project. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Wonderful. Okay. As I was saying, um, we're hoping today to give everyone a chance to express all of their viewpoints because all of our perspectives have a lot of concerns about how climate may impact us. And my next question is, I propose some perspectives that might be common and important, but there are plenty that we're forgetting. So if you said other, what is another perspective that should be considered as we're considering the climate action plan? And if you don't have one, you don't have to enter. But if you did put other, what is something else that you were thinking of? Yes, student, wonderful, youth, educators, absolutely. I love too that we had even uh, all species, so wildlife represented as well. Just a few more questions in a few words. What concerns you the most about climate change in Alachua County? Heat, yes. Luckily today, we're getting a little bit of a cooler stint. We're seeing water, storms, heat clearly a big concern is one of the biggest responses here. Hurricanes, of course, we've experienced a lot of that this fall. Food security. Great, we can see a lot, a lot of things are on our mind and hopefully we'll get a chance to dig into some of this today. that we have, I have kind of a tough question to pose to you. How optimistic are you feeling about the future in Alachua County? You could do a one, which is not optimistic at all, or a five, which is very optimistic, or a three, somewhere in the middle. All right, it looks like we're coming in with a pretty clear average of somewhat optimistic, and hopefully today some of the things we'll learn may move the needle on that a little bit. Well, thank you so much for your time and helping us get to know you a little bit more. We're gonna be using this tool a few more times um, throughout the day, but do remember at any point if you have a question, go ahead and type it into that question um, option, or if you wanted to do a question on paper, we have the cards for that up here as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hopefully this microphone stays on and let's get started to our next speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker who is uh, one of my favorite environmental journalists. Uh, Cynthia Barnett is an award-winning reporter and author who has written about water and climate change issues around the world for more than two decades. Um, she left her books out of her official bio, but I wanted to, to mention them because I love them all and probably could buy them at a local bookstore like The Links. Um, I would highly recommend them. There's Mirage, Blue Revolution, Rain, and most recently, The Sound of the Sea. She's also the director of the Climate and Environmental Reporting Initiatives at the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, where her program has trained some of the nation's leading climate reporters. Cynthia Barnett, welcome. Thank you, Nathan. Okay. 
Oh, with thanks, with thanks to my friend John Moran for setting our mood. <clears throat> In June of 1883, a man named Hurlbert set out on a trip from Jacksonville to New Orleans. Back then, the fastest route was to take a train to the bustling city of Cedar Key and then a steamboat across the Gulf of Mexico. Unfortunately for him, the route took Hurlbert through the middle of Alachua County. That summer, North Florida was dealing with devastating outbreaks of smallpox. Alachua County established a quarantine to protect its citizens from the deadly infection, also citing the need to protect the consumptives who flocked here in that era to heal from tuberculosis at springs like Magnesia near Hawthorne. Lawmen stopped trains at the county line, turning back passengers who had been in infected cities. Hurlbert was furious. He was a minister and a family man. Palatka had let him through fine. But despite raising a ruckus and spending the night on the train platform, he never did get to travel through Alachua County. He told, uh-oh. <laughs> and it was at such an exciting point in the story. It's a cliffhanger. Is it back? No. Do I project enough in the back? Yeah. Yes. Professor Malky? Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're hearing some hmms. Okay. I'm going to hand this to you so you can turn it off so we don't get that horrible. Okay. <clears throat> he told his story to the Times Union newspaper of Jacksonville, which was having nothing of Alachua County's absurd quarantine. Under the headline, Fool's Paradise, the paper published a screed to, and I quote, let outsiders know that the asses of Alachua County are a peculiar breed not elsewhere prevalent in <laughs> It was neither the first nor the last time Alachua County was accused of being peculiar. <laughs> Asses, I am not sure about. <laughs> but it is fair to say that the county became known for its efforts to provide a safe home for those who live here and a safe harbor for vulnerable people who migrated here, visited here, or lived here temporarily. Those have included the large population of formerly enslaved people who came to start new lives here after the Civil War, the consumptive northerners who recuperated here during TB epidemics, and of course the hundreds of thousands of young people who have made a temporary home here while studying at the University of Florida. If that makes us a peculiar breed, then I am especially proud to join you, my fellow asses of <laughs> <laughs> to launch an action plan for climate change, which endangers our communities, people, ecosystems, and infrastructure like few other threats in our history. We have met many other historic turning points with creativity, foresight, and investment especially when it came to education, public health, and environmental protection. But as we confront climate change, it is also worth remembering those times we were on the wrong side of history. The Reconstruction era following the Civil War opened with incredible promise in Alachua County. African Americans were purchasing farms and launching businesses, 
The county was known for the best schools in the state for both black and white children. <clears throat> Alachua County was an epicenter of African American political leadership. Josiah Wells, a mayor of Gainesville and Florida's first black congressman, and Matthew Louie, a mayor of Noonansville, judge and state lawmaker, launched Florida's first biracial political party. Louie started Florida's first statewide black newspaper, the Florida Sentinel. But a white counterassault to hold on to the racial hierarchy of the past turned lethal and ultimately succeeded to disenfranchise black citizens. <coughs> The KKK was just one of several white terror organizations to take hold in this county, which had one of the highest rates of lynching in the state, including the 1916 mass lynching in Newberry. In my own profession, news coverage of racial violence was utterly biased, racist, and cruel. These kinds of stories are especially important for us to share and remember now as state government quashes discussion around race and social justice in the public schools and even in the curriculum at the University of Florida. Here, here. When it comes to climate change, too, textbook authors this summer were told to delete references to climate change from science books before they could be accepted for use in Florida's public schools. To be a Floridian and to be an Alachua County citizen is to hold profoundly different realities. One moment you swoon at the black-edged wings of a swallow-tailed kite in the most luminous light you've ever seen. The next moment you wonder when you will be called upon to take a stand for more than the birds and the water against injustices that may range from a talented climate colleague who has been laid off to a roundup of immigrants. As we work to make Alachua County a safe home and a safe harbor in the face of climate change, I'd like to leave you with three lessons from our history. First, expect the unexpected. One certainty about climate change is the uncertainty it will bring. Stable worlds change. Noonansville, the original county seat, was a bustling settlement in the 1840s. The railroad passed it by and a great hurricane bore down in September 1896. The following spring, the post office where Matthew Louie had once served as postmaster shuttered, reopening in Alachua. In 1883, the same year Hurlbert tried to defy the county's quarantine, <coughs> The journalist Carl Weber published his book, Eden of the South, a fascinating look at 19th century Alachua County. The subtitle is worth mentioning, descriptive of the orange groves, vegetable farms, strawberry fields, peach orchards, soil, climate, natural peculiarities, <laughs> and the people of Alachua County, Florida. Business leaders then expected the county's center of economic power would be New Gainesville, a platted town in East Gainesville with a hygienic hotel and TV sanatoriums to draw wealthy northerners for rest cures. The county was then known for cotton, tobacco, and vast orange groves that filled the air with sweet perfume. No one would have imagined then that New Gainesville's main road, Alachua Avenue, would never be built, or that the orange groves would soon be destroyed by freezer, freezes, 
forcing growers to abandon the county. My second lesson from history is to center community, for that's where we do our most authentic good. Talking about climate change with your neighbors here, in a college hall, or in churches, fraternal organizations, or at free yoga on the plaza, you will connect in ways you can't on social media, where misinformation now spreads 10 times faster than credible reporting. From enhanced green spaces to community gardens, many of the climate solutions being proposed by the county and the city of Gainesville build human connections as they solve climate problems. They deserve special emphasis. I want to suggest that young people in our county also deserve special emphasis in these plans, given efforts to sanitize the climate story from their school books. Third, last, and most importantly, the past cries out for us to choose the right side of history. This means continued work to undo the legacy of segregation that to this day burdens our neighbors in East Gainesville with uniquely high energy costs. It means preparing for the wave of climate migrants already moving to Alachua County as Floridians displaced by storms and sea rise continue to flee the coast. It means ensuring that non-English speakers gain better access to emergency information in hurricanes and other disasters. All of these goals are raised in the climate action plans you'll work on today. The climate conscious strategies in the county and city's plans take vulnerable people into account. They take vulnerable infrastructure into account. They take vulnerable ecosystems into account with the call to protect a third of our land and water by 2030. With your help, these strategies can cultivate the safe home and safe harbor that drew many of us here, keep many of us here, and help prepare us for the stormy times we will face together as a community. Peculiar as ever. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. There was so much great stuff in there. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, we we'll have a microphone working again, so if you, you want to get up here and get your stuff loaded while I yeah, take a look at some of your ventures. Yeah. So, TV meteorologists really are, are some of the most trusted voices uh, in their communities on uh, climate issues. I think that um, we've seen across Florida that the uh, meteorologists have kind of led the way, really, and, and, and explaining to the public uh, the impacts of, of, of a changing climate. And so that's why I'm very pleased to introduce our uh, next speaker here today. Bill Quin Quinlan was chief meteorologist at WCG TV 20 for 27 years from 1996 through earlier this year. Throughout his time at TV 20, Bill led a team of meteorologists to cover daily forecasts for North Central Florida, as well as extreme weather like tornadoes and hurricanes. Getting the presentation started here in a second. Very, very quick. <laughs> I have 25 minutes, and we'll see how long 
this goes. So we're going to talk about the impacts of weather and climate uh, with uh, respect to the vulnerability assessment uh, for the county of Latchville. So weather versus climate. A lot of people don't know the difference. We're going to talk a little bit about meteorology and a little bit about what the impacts of that weather and climate is going to be on Alachua County from the study that has been done. Now, I am not an author of the study. I was not involved in the study, but I am interpreting the results here. So, weather. Definition of weather is the current state of the atmosphere. In other words, temperature, humidity, wind, whatever you have outside right now is the weather. The climate is different. The climate is the expected frequency of the state of the atmosphere over a longer period of time, 20 or 30 years. So one way to describe it, if you are looking at yourself and whatever you're wearing right now, that's the weather. You're ready for the weather for the day. If you look into your closet, how many different types of outfits have, that's the climate that you live in. Mark Twain said, climate is what you want because of the averages and how beautiful it is. Weather is what you get. Always changing, <laughs> hot, cold, snow, hopefully not here, but rain. So the climate change threats for Alachua County. Well, we have extreme heat, rainfall, and believe it or not, sea level rise. We're landlocked. How can sea level rise have an impact here? You're going to find out towards the end of the presentation. So you notice the extreme heat has impacts for areas with hotter days, longer drought, increased uh, wildfire threat, and you have to have climate mitigation. In other words, what are you going to do to help people survive changes in climate? Heavy rainfall, of course, increased flooding also has an impact on the wildfire threat and the potential for climate mitigation. And sea level, sea level rise has increased flooding and also climate mitigation. And we're going to talk about every single one of these don't get overwhelmed by this graphic, we're really, uh, busy. All right, so how does the weather actually work? Well, it works because of the sun. The sun beats down on the earth, the earth absorbs that energy and then reflects it back up on the atmosphere, creates the clouds, creates the pressure differences, creates the temperature differences, and that's what drives the weather day to day. Even at nighttime, even though the sun is not here, the heat from that sun warms up the ground. So how do you get the temperature during the day? One of the reasons we don't have the hottest time of the day at noon when the sun is right overhead is because there's a delay. You have to heat the ground before you heat the air. So that's how the weather actually works. But the climate has a lot of different components. You'll notice here the sun works, puts all the energy down, but it gets absorbed into the earth in different fashions either in the hydrosphere or the water, lakes, rivers, oceans, gets absorbed into the ground, gets, a, gets pushed back up into the atmosphere from the uh, ice caps and other uh, mountainous areas where there may be some snow with a high albedo, which is a very bright area that reflects sunlight. Darker areas absorb that energy, so that would help to create the potential for a climate shift how things are going to change. And of course, human influences is what most people are studying now to determine what the effects of climate are going to be because you're adding all of these aerosols into the air, which absorb more of that energy and don't allow it to be released back up into space. So here's a look at a graph that essentially shows the temperatures, highs and lows, all the way through 2023. Now, the study that we're going to look at, some of the data here in a minute, does not include 2023 or 2024, which so far have been the warmest global temperatures in history. This year is going to surpass last year. Now, those are anecdotal because they're not built into the study, but that is not a trend you want to have every other year coming up. The next one is warmer than the next. Hopefully we're not at that tipping point and we can do something about it. So you look at this graph, the blue is the actual highs and lows for the day. You can see how much variation there is. The red line there, that actually shows you the record highs for the last 30 years and the record lows in the light blue. 
So we're going to bring the average temperature range for Gainesville Regional Airport right there. So that's what it should be. So that's when you're looking at climate, you're saying, oh, that's, that's the perfect temperature regime we have during the day. But look how many times it goes above that and below that. There's a lot of variability. That's what makes climate science so difficult to forecast. So the record highs, record lows. The problem with 2023 was that we had 11 new record highs. First in March, then April, then in August, where we got to about 99 degrees, I think three days in a row in 2023 in August. And even in November, we had record highs. Now, it wasn't excessive, it wasn't 95, 100 degrees, but it was close to 90. So you can see how the trend here is not something we really want to have. So this is one part of the study, and it shows you the uh, average annual minimum and maximum temperatures, or the highs and lows that you would expect to see average through the year. And the first one, the baseline, 83 and 60. Climate, perfect. That's why we live here. Absolutely gorgeous weather, right? Well, you go to 2030, it bumps up a little bit. Not too much of a change there. But then you get to 2040, jumps up maybe one degree. I think that's where we're looking at the tipping point here, around 2040 to 2050, and look how it jumps. It's the average maximum and minimum temperatures, 89 for the high. That's through the entire year. Now it's 83. Just think about if you're adding six degrees what the average temperature is, it's going to be miserable outside. Now this is just the temperature. We haven't even talked about humidity yet. And the nighttime lows keep coming up uh, from 60 to 67 for the average. So here's the annual maximum and minimum temperature. So that was the average. This is the actual potential for high temperatures for the day. 101.9 is what we have now. Now, it's rare that we will see a temperature at 100 degrees or above. Heat index, that's a different story. But we get about 98, 99 once or twice. We might break 100 degrees, uh, but we're not going to have too many like that right now. Look what happens to that temperature as it goes through the next 75 years. Goes up to 103 by 2030, 2040. Not much of a change there. But 106 for the high temperature, and then 107 by 2100. So 75 years down the line, we're looking at 110 degrees for the maximum temperature we can get to. That's almost 10 degrees above what it would be now. And what do you expect the heat index associated? We'll get to that. <laughs> You're getting ahead of you. Uh, so, but one thing you also want to notice here is look at the nighttime lows. It's not just the heat during the day, it's the heat at night, which is going to cause tremendous amount of issues with power consumption, people's ability to stay cool at nighttime, who has lived through a hurricane when you had your power go out? Right. And you've had to suffer through maybe 72, 73, or 75 degrees at nighttime. You get your windows open. You don't have a fan because there's no electricity, and you just sweat. You can't get comfortable. You can't sleep. Imagine if that temperature goes up above 80 degrees and stays there for several nights. We'll talk about that in a second. Thank you. So here's the average annual number of freeze events. Right now you see the variability of well, the standard deviation is that the line on the graph there, it's pretty uh, extensive. So it can go anywhere from one night all the way up to about 12 to 13 nights. And the average is about six nights below. That's below 32 degrees. Not, not into the 20s, just 32 degrees or lower. By 2030 it drops to four. By 2040 it drops to about three. By 2070, it drops to 1. In 2175 years, we don't have any more freezing temperatures. Well, what's wrong with not having freezing temperatures? I, I don't want to have cold weather. That's an annoyance you go outside, you have to put a jacket on. Well, the problem is, lack of freeze events causes dangerous impacts, potential increase in tropical disease. What you have in South Florida now will be up here, including equine encephalitis. Triple E, which we have, it isn't too extensive, but imagine that expanding in coverage and affecting not just horses, but people. You have West Nile virus, malaria has already been found in areas of Sarasota. 
And that will make its way up here as the climate shifts through the next 75 years and maybe even dengue fever. All deadly diseases. What's the number one deadliest animal in the world? Mosquitoes. Yeah. Mosquitoes. Yeah. We don't want that. So here's a, a look at the uh, number of nights. We talked about um, warm nights above 80 degrees. I checked this year, we managed to get up to 79 for an overnight low one time. We didn't break 80 degrees, so that's good. But this is what we're looking at here. We're going to go from zero nights or days with 80 degrees at nighttime from zero all the way up to 73. That's almost a month and a half. That's three quarters of the summer where it never goes below 80 degrees at nighttime. Just think of how much energy people are going to have to use to sustain themselves at nighttime. And the folks that can't afford that, they're going to have to turn off the air conditioning. Or other people that don't have air conditioning, you're going to have to deal with that heat and humidity. Everyone's going to be miserable. The uh, potential for health impacts is very, very high. All right. It's not the heat, it's the humidity, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Humidity. That's the calculation. That's the calculation for how to, it's not just you take the percentage, uh, humidity and temperature and combine them. You have to use this calculation. And you see how it actually affects folks when you get up to about uh, 103 degrees extreme caution. The National Weather Service puts out warnings when you get to 105 that will give a heat advisory. Anything above 110 they issue a heat, excessive heat warning, which we have all the time in the summertime because we're normally going to see a heat index 105, maybe 110 a bunch of times during the summer. But here's an easier way to look at it instead of uh, calculating that yourself. This is a, a the National Weather Service site. You can get this online anywhere. Uh, just type in heat index calculation, and this will come up. So in Alachua County, generally in the summer, we have uh, 95 to maybe 100, 108, maybe 110. Uh, without humidity, but the temperature of 100, and, what, 134, almost 140 degrees. Yeah. You couldn't survive on this for an extended period of time. Uh, the problem is, is that it's going to keep going up. The humidity is going to keep rising, the temperature is going to keep rising, and it's going to become more and more uncomfortable through the year. So here's a look at what the uh, the study pointed out the number of days that you have for very hot, which would be 105 to 129 degrees. Now you have to remember that the heat index that you're issued on TV or you get on your phone, the heat index that is expected for that day is in the shade. Heat index potential when you go out into the sun is easily 10 to 15 degrees more. So that's why when you have workers out they have to stay hydrated, they have to have breaks. It's just very dangerous to be in that condition. So you're easily in a normal day in the summer here, you only heat index of 110. Well, the potential is 125 out in the sun if people are working outside. So we're gonna go for about very hot right now. We have average about 71 days of a heat index of above 105. That's not that unusual. When we go to 89, we jump it up about 10% days by 2030. Then it was 100 days on 2040, 110 days by 2070, but by the time we get to 2100, 75 years down the line, we only have 105 days from 105 to 129, but look what happens to the above 130 heat index. It goes up to 61. I do not want to live here if that's what's going to happen. Excessive heat vulnerability, urban areas. Now, I'm not sure if this map is the current uh, cooling centers. Yeah. It is. I suspect you're probably going to have to triple the number of cooling centers if we have that type of heat and humidity moving into the area. Urban areas, very susceptible. Not that other folks out and about, but the heat island effect, where you have the sun beating down all, all the concrete and tar, it doesn't release the heat. And at nighttime, it's going to stay. And if you have a temperature staying above 80 degrees, it's not going to allow any of that heat to be released and cool down at all over the next half a century. All right, we just talked about people. Now we have to talk about agricultural impacts. These nice beef cows just sitting there enjoying a nice summer day, hanging out. 
but increased temperatures, the highs and the lows, not the low temperature, but the lack of heat, uh, lack of cool, cooling, I would say, can reduce food availability. So we talked about the heat index, that's on the uh, right side of the screen. The uh, temperature and humidity index is something you use for cattle especially, but other livestock as well, and how it's impacted. So, the average milk production for cows is about 50 to 53 pounds of milk a day. That's about six gallons a day. So you can see, you get some loss when you have the heat index jumping up, uh, or that the humidity index jumping up to around 70, 71, 72. <coughs> Uh, when you get up to um, milk loss of six pounds per day. So that's uh, almost a 10% reduction in your milk uh, production from your cows. So any farmers will tell you if it gets hot, the cows aren't producing any milk. Well, when you get up into the milk loss in the uh, darker red area, we're looking uh, at almost a 15% loss. That is gonna impact the farmer's bottom line. They are not gonna be able to survive that kind of economic disparity if they get too much heat building in. And once you get above that into the 90 to 100 degree for the uh, heat index there, well, there's no milk and potentially animals could pass away. So, agricultural impacts. Peanuts, dry up, fall off, don't grow. Corn, dries up, no food there for the humans or the cows. Soybean, dries up. Big problem, just from the heat. And of course, the dairy we just talked about. All right, so now we're gonna go back to uh, grammar school. How many people remember this thing? There we go. Uh, so there's not gonna be a quiz at the end, unless he wants to do a quiz. Maybe I'll ask him a question, see what he does. Uh, so you see the water cycle. Essentially, the, the sun heats the ground, the ground evaporates the water, either uh, from the oceans and the rivers or from the plants in uh, transpiration, gets up into the atmosphere, mixes with the water vapor, cools off, creates clouds, you get rain, you get snow. This is an example of the rainfall accumulation data, not the yearly distribution, but the rainfall accumulation data of Gainesville from uh, last year at the airport. Now you'll notice uh, the blue line is the, uh, the record high in 2017 the red line is the record low in 2011, and the uh, green line is the actual uh, data for last year. Now the uh, tan line is the average, what we should have. So last year was above average, but you see how much of more above average the blue line was. The problem is the distribution of rainfall can change. That's one of the problems with climate shifting, climate change, is that the rainfall distribution may be less in the winter, or more in the winter, or more in the summer, it changes a little bit here and there. It's a little bit more variable with all the models. But you'll notice, even on the 27 record year, uh, uh, year record uh, yearly rainfall, that was a very dry spring. We had a huge drought problem in that year, going from February all the way through about the beginning of June. And then we started to get some uh, sea breeze thunderstorms building up and even some tropical systems later on in the year. I think that was the year of Irma. So that's why we had that big jump of rainfall in September that brought us up to the record highs. But extreme drought can be a problem, even in a record year. You'll notice in the, the red line, which is the record low year of 2011, we had a very wet spring in winter and then we dried out through the summer because in 2011, we had no tropical systems whatsoever. We had some sea breeze action, which we usually get, but even that was muted for a month of the year. So here's a look at the consecutive days without rainfall from the study. Uh, doesn't look too excessive here. We go from 18 days to 21 by 2100, but that could be the difference between a failed crop and a safe crop. If you're waiting for rain and you don't have the uh, aquaculture to be able to spread out all that water across with uh, sprayers or so forth, you're gonna want your crops just shrivel up and die. Then the other problem we have is the, uh, the drought index. This is the Peach Byron drought index. It's a way you measure the amount of moisture in the ground and in the plants that makes it available for potential wildfire. So wildfire threat actually goes up 
when you go from about 300 to 450, that's pretty average or a low uh, threat level. You get into medium threat level from 500 to 650 for the measurement of that drought index, and then you get above 700, it's extreme, and that's when you have wildfires. How many remember 20, uh, no, not, I'm getting back in my days, uh, 1997, 1998, what happened that year? Fires. 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 smoke a lot. Right, Waldo almost burnt to the ground. Yep, that was, I mean, fires all across, that was the heaviest fire season across the entire state, I believe, in uh, 1998. So the problem is you're going from a huge uh, change in the baseline, you can see the uh, standard deviation there, that line goes anywhere from about 400 all the way up to almost uh, 725. But by the time we get to 2100, the variation is very low and we are almost always in the extreme category. That's the drought. That's the problem we're going to have. So here's what happens with the potential impacts of droughts. It is uh, reduced agricultural production, decrease uh, local plants and animals, increase in sinkholes. So sinkholes can form because the aquifer drops, leaving that space underneath the ground that's not supporting the ground anymore. And then you get a heavy rainfall event that gets too heavy and it collapses. We've seen that a number of times in Lachlan County. That threat is going to continue. And of course, increased wildfire threat as well. All right, rainfall. This is what we get during the year, average. We're looking at generally a fairly dry uh, winter and spring. And this is from 20, uh, 2000 to 2024. So you'll notice here, it's fairly dry in the winter and fall. And then the rainy season is in the summer. The peak of the rainy season is actually in June because of, not because of tropical systems, but because of these sea breeze thunderstorms that move on through. Now there's not as much of a change in the study as far as the uh, wet season. Uh, it's fairly variable. You see it goes from 30 down to uh, up to about 31 inches. Uh, the dry season, however, does change. That goes from 22 inches up to 25. You wouldn't think that would be a lot, but the problem is that's during the time of year when it's not supposed to rain much. And you add too much rain, you're going to cause too much wildfire, uh, too much growth of the underbrush. So a wetter winter creates increased growth of biofuels. That's all the grass and plants that grow very quickly, which is exactly what happened in 1997-1998. It stopped raining the beginning of March. It didn't rain again until the probably the end of June. And all of that fuel was set to burn. Logic also causes longer spring droughts, rise in wildfire threats uh, through the late spring like we had the other year. All right, let's talk about flooding. Flooding, we have river flooding. We have aerial flooding. Now, I say aerial flooding, that's over in the area. It's not in the air. I got that all the time when people call this in the air. Why are you talking about what's going on in the air? I'm not, it's over the area. Flash flooding, of course, is a huge problem in Alaska County, the number of roadways we have as well. The problem is we're gonna have more short-term, high-volume rain events. That means you're looking at thunderstorm activity with maybe, instead of two inches, you might get five or six or seven inches of rain. So how do we get our rain? Well, in the wintertime, you usually look at cold fronts, warm fronts, stationary fronts, and occasionally included front, depending on how the storm set up. Now, you can have cold fronts come through different times of year. Well, the reason it's cold outside this morning is because we had a cold front move through yesterday that brought in the drier, cooler air, so it cooled down. Didn't have any rain with it, at least much at all, because it came in relatively dry. Hence, the dry season in November, December, January. Now, the, rain, the wet season, of course, we have the sea breeze thunderstorms, generally producing about three to five inches of rainfall, and tropical systems, and as much as 10 to 20 inches of rain. Now, the climate variability in tropical systems is still being studied. There's no real concrete evidence of how that's going to impact the tropics. That's something that's gonna be studied down the line. But anyway, you have to talk about the flooding potential. This is the uh, FEMA flood map for Alachua County. Zone A, widespread, zone, zone E, you can read down the bottom, which either one is, can't get rid of the, uh, the title down there, but, um, and AE and uh, AO. So essentially, every place that is colored on this map, you need to have flood insurance. Now the flood insurance, of course, is a bit of a problem, but the good news is about Latchman County, we have a lot of 
public conservation area. Adding to that will help reduce the flood threat because you won't have as much of an impact because of reduced development in those areas. But every one of these areas that's even near the lakes or rivers will be uh, potential for flood insurance. A lot of the areas outside don't have flood insurance, but you can still get flooded in those areas with these excessive rainfall events. High priority areas, high priority areas along I-75. Here's gonna zoom in and go through these quickly. Here's one uh, west of I-75, Newbury Road southward, and then we go from Newbury Road northwards towards Meadowbrook. Who have been up by Meadowbrook and seen that flooding when they can only have about seven, eight inches of rain in that area. You can't drive down that road. It floods up the Meadowbrook Golf Course and then floods over uh, the other roads up there too. And then you go from uh, just east of I-75, uh, from uh, North Florida Regional Medical Center all the way up to um, 39th Avenue. And there can be a number of variants there. So the most vulnerable assets for flooding are in infrastructure and emergency services. In other words, if the roads flood, you can't get the emergency services out to help people, but also you're looking at the potential for residential and commercial flooding in the property. So that's one of the big issues with flooding. You can see it's not just in urban areas, it's outside of those urban areas as well. And here's a, a map that you can look at. It's actually in the study, if you go online, uh, if you do the study from Latchford County, you'll be able to look at this. But you see a slight increase in the vulnerability of these areas for critical infrastructure and of course in residential areas up about 15% from 8% where they are now. So let's talk about climate change, ocean climate change, how it's gonna affect it. Warmer water temperatures equals an expanding ocean volume. And expanding, expanding volume means sea level rise. This is the world sea level rise. Here's a graph of that. You see it's rising fairly quickly. In the last 20 years, we've seen globally three inch in 20 years. That is not sustainable. If we can't do something to change that, it's just going to keep going up, and this is the impact it's going to have. Here's Cedar Key. Now, I know we don't live at Cedar Key, but look what happens at Cedar Key. It goes anywhere from, by 2050, we're looking at a foot to foot and a half, to as much as uh, two to four feet on the high end, all the way up by 2100, uh, almost seven feet of rise. What do you think at Cedar Key would do around the, the ocean? That, that's not storm surge. That's what the ocean is going to be, seven feet from what it is now. Okay, here's a look uh, across north central Florida, how that is going to impact us here. So this is the base level. You see the area that we go up to about 2050. We're looking at 1.3 feet of sea level rise. On either coastline, you can see how it's impacting the St. John's River and then the Suwannee River. And the Suwannee River, what happens when the Suwannee River gets backed up? The San Jose River can't flow into it, so that backs up, which is on our northern county, so that affects our county as well. This is 2080, 3.4 feet, so we're almost double, more than doubling it by 2080. I don't have anything past 2080, but here's the impact. Uh, saltwater intrusion, inland flooding, low, medium, and high. So if you're on the coast, you're not living on the coast, it's not sustainable anymore. Where are you going to move? Alachua County, Columbia County, Marion County. So that's what you have to plan for if we don't do something about sea level rise. So here's the uh, conclusions. I'll just read these for you so you don't have to spend time moving through. So extreme temperatures will likely impact all residents in Alachua County, creating uncomfortable and potentially dangerous conditions with an increased risk of disease and decreased food availability. High intensity rainfall events with flooding and flash flooding potential will increase the rising content of atmospheric moisture due to warm atmosphere and sea level rise can be inundation of sea level uh, seawater along the coast, restricting natural flow of water patterns and rivers and flooding in upstream and inland areas. The low probability events in the average rainfall, you see the variability with that depends on how the weather is going to set up from day to day. Uh, local rainfall effects are subject to a wide variation and uh, tropical system frequency as further uncertainty exists in evolving tropical weather components due to climate change. I can just say it's not going to be good. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Bill. I mean, that was a lot. Um, you know, I, I think that you know, editing a website could call debating C, you know, and it was started in the South Florida because the effects of sea level rise impacted them. And I think that sometimes we kind of smug, like, I'm in, I'm in inland Florida. I don't have to worry about that. Well, your presentation showed not only your sea level rise, the sea level rise may impact us here, but extreme heat and all these other impacts are, are very serious as well. So it was very high level presentation. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're about to go to a break. I think Stacy's going to, oh, we could do some, some, some Mentimeter activities. And then hopefully um, we can go from the climate impacts to what we can do about it real soon. And um, we'll break. All right. So we learned a lot about what's predicted for the future. And we have a few questions for you to reflect on. Um, so if you need to access the Mentimeter again, you can do the QR code on your agenda or it'll be at the top. Our first question is about right now. How is your daily life already impacted by some of the impacts you just learned about, including heat waves, flooding, and severe storms? So a one is not affected at all, a three is somewhat affected, and a five is very affected. <laughs> all right, we're kind of landed in that a little over three range, which means that we're already experiencing some of these on our, our day to day. Diving in a little deeper, how prepared do you feel we are to deal with some of the incoming changes we just learned about? Uh, one is not prepared at all, and a five is very prepared, and a three is somewhat prepared. Some votes coming in, but we can see that we're not feeling like our preparation is where it could be considering what we might expect in the coming years. And our next question is again about the now. What are some of the things already happening that need immediate attention in your neighborhood? And you can select, I think, all. Um, oh, we've got yeah, a lot going on. <laughs> Potentially, tax can include flooding, heat waves energy outages or how long it takes to get your power restored, infrastructure damage to your roads or to your utility lines, the cost of having to run your energy during some of these extreme temperatures, and then of course the public health risks that we already learned about with mosquitoes and more. Looks like a lot of concerns across the board the heat definitely being one of the big ones. All right, well, thank you so much. We'll return uh, to this after we learn more about the climate action plan. But I'm gonna turn it over to Stacy to talk about the breakout rooms of the break. Hey everyone, if you haven't met me yet, I'm Stacey Greco, I work with Steven in the county's Environmental Protection Department, and I am standing between you and break, because I need to give you some special instructions. So we've got a break, there's going to be more refreshments back in that room if you go out and you take a right, it's that next room to the right. We've got more coffee and some pastries and things like that. So help yourself, but don't get too distracted, because right after the break, we're going to go out into some breakout presentations. So if you look at your agenda, the front page, the blue table, those are the presentations. And there's two that are downstairs here. They're past the coffee and the break room. And then there's four that are upstairs. The stairs and the elevator are out by the entranceway. And so what we're going to do is you're going to get to go to two of these. So if you go to one and it's really crowded, Go to your second choice and then come back. And we're going to split, we're going to switch. So you'll have 20 minutes in that breakout room and then um, they'll kick you out and you'll go and you'll find your other one. There's five minutes in between. So that's what we're going to do after the break. And I'm going to ask if you are one of my speakers or a moderator for these, if you could make sure that you make it to your room by 1055. And then all of you, while you're enjoying your coffee and everything, start to think about where you're going to go so that you can be in the 
a room at 11 because we really do have a tight agenda because there's so much to talk about today. So thank you so much. And we're very honored and pleased to have three important community leaders here with us this morning. I'm going to have them introduce themselves, but we have Hawthorne Mayor Jackie Randall down at the end. We've got Waldo Manager Kim Worley in the middle, and we have Gainesville's Brian Eastman here to my left. Each of them is going to introduce themselves and then give a just five minute overview of their particular community concerns and perhaps some strategies that they're thinking about just to get us started today. So um, Jackie, if you'd be willing to start, and again, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, hello everyone. Um, I am Jacqueline Still, currently serving as the mayor of Hawthorne, and I think that we kind of lucked out and started the discussion a little bit earlier than the county, um, thanks to a local committee that goes around and helps municipalities that want to engage in these type of discussions. So Hawthorne was able to host its first climate change event. Um, we title it the Our Sustainability um, and Resilience um, event. And from that uh, summit, we were able to gather what impacts look like for the city of Hawthorne. And um, now to us, where we kind of came to the conversation thinking that we were impacted with flooding, much like the rest of the county is, honestly not that out of more impact is wildfires. And so I think it's very important for city leaders to take the initiatives to start having these discussions within their own jurisdiction to see exactly what that impact will look like and then come back to the, you know, the key table, the benchmark that the county is building and um, expand that, that conversation. So for us, again, it was uh, wildfires and I think that we have done a great job of starting um, the initiatives that we'll roll out going forward by simply just having the, the community to come together here, what our impacts are and how that we can really navigate through those in the years and months ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that. Hi, I'm Kim Worley, City Manager of Waldo. And um, basically, Waldo has the fires and we have flooding. Usually not at the same time, unfortunately, but that really helps. <laughs> <laughs> but um, right now, I think our biggest issue is flooding. We do um, are having a vulnerability study done by the Army Corps of Engineers, and then also we're going we're combining that grant with a grant from DEP with another vulnerability study to look at our future up to 2080. And I'm Florida born and raised. I was born down in Hollywood. I've lived in Cedar Key, so I do know hurricanes very well, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, the um, they have gotten stronger. My family's still in Cedar Key, and. This year was pretty devastating for them, but the um, luckily our houses are fine. But but you know the climate is changing; things are changing, and I think people need to become more aware. We're just talking about how can we get it into schools because it's great to do that because kids do understand and they teach their parents. And you know they, we did a thing in the summer camp about water conservation, and it was really cool that I could hear the kids getting up to their parents and things like that. So the, the unfortunate thing, if you paid attention to the map, one thing is Waldo and Hawthorne are cool. I don't know if you noticed that on the map, but we are cool. <laughs> so that's awesome, you should remember that. But um, if you look at the map for Waldo, really we probably shouldn't be there, it is a swamp. You know, and if you look at the map, basically where um, 301 is and the train track, so we know who took care of that and why it's not a swamp without those two issues. Um, but with small towns, the biggest issues are, we know what the issues are, but having the funding to fix them. That's that's probably our biggest problem. And um, these kinds of things are expensive. And it was it was interesting, the Army Corps of Engineers, I had sent them all the maps and stuff that I had. And they, sh they have a, a fantastic um, map that actually shows how the water flows, especially with, when it's really high water from the storms and that type of thing. And it, you know, Florida is basically a swamp. So, you know, we are wet. And then they did some studies about if we put in ponds, like literally everywhere in Waldo, and how much difference it made, and it really made like that much difference. And it was amazing because that would be millions of dollars of things to do that don't make a big difference. So all of that's it's interesting. And I think sometimes, you know, people do look at the cities um, or the government to fix everything, and, and we don't always have all the answers. So that is hard. And they just want to scream at you, and it's like, didn't you get your parents? I mean, didn't that land come from your grandparents? Yeah, did it flood when they were little? And you were little? Yeah. Well, no. <laughs> but they all want to 
divert it to the neighbors, you know, because they won't mind. <laughs> so, so I think that's the biggest issue for small towns, having the funding um, to get it done and having the funding to get the studies done. So I was grateful for the Army Corps of Engineers and the new DEP for getting that really good together. Well, um, I'm Brian Eastman. I'm from Gainesville City Commission District 4, which represents sort of a duck pond and, and that area going on over through Forest Ridge and 34. So my district in particular is very interested in climate change. We have a lot of uh, a lot of professors live in my district, a lot of students live in that district. Uh, and just this is a community that's cared a lot about this issue. Um, it's, uh, and it's something that the city has been working really, really hard on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Waldo talked about what it's like to be a small town working on this. We're sort of the, the regional employment center uh, for the area, right? So we have UF Health, Shands, the VA. So we have the kind of the responsibility of people are living here or they are coming in from out. Uh, how do we ensure that people are able to get around uh, in a way that if they don't want to use a car, they can get around using a bicycle or using the RTS system? Um, we have to make sure that you know that people are able to live here, so that they don't, so that we don't have the sprawl that we've seen as uh, you know has a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions. And so there's uh, so we're dealing with a lot of those urban planning questions of how exactly do you make sure that people live here while retaining what it is that people loved about Gainesville in the first place and what uh, was there for us. Uh, then also um, we've been working a lot on plans. If you haven't seen it yet, our 2024 City of Gainesville Climate Resiliency Plan uh, talks about how do we as a city itself uh, move forward and make sure that uh, that we are reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions. So we have a uh, our uh, zero waste ordinance was passed in 2020 that uh, really that worked to expand out composting, worked to improve recycling, uh, make that system much more efficient. Um, uh, if food scraps in particular create methane um, at, at uh, at the waste management facility, which has a much, much larger effect on the on, uh, on greenhouse gas emissions. So we're working right now on implementing that. Um, we have a plan to uh, to become a fully electric fleet by 2040. So um, making sure that our transportation is uh, is reducing that overall uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so um, we've been working very, very hard as a city to to get grants and move forward on finding ways that you have both we internally move forward on making sure that we're reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Then how do we create a city that makes it easier for people um, who are just trying to get through their day-to-day -day lives, who are just trying to make it to work, who are just trying to make it to the grocery store? How do you make it easier for them to live a lifestyle that allows them to use less greenhouse gas emissions? And so um, so we've been, been really focused on that. I'm happy to talk more about that um, over the course of it. Great, thank you to all three of you. Um, I'd like to open up for questions in a few minutes, but um, as mayor, as manager, as commissioner, you have to deal with a, a, a whole range of issues, right? There's health care, there's energy, there are all these different things. Um, climate change and responding to climate change is, for many of us, kind of an abstract uh, idea, and you have very diverse communities, each of you. I'm wondering if you could talk briefly about how you try to engage with those diverse communities on issues that um, are not always as straightforward as you know, climate change. Would you mind starting there? Sure, um, and thank you for that great question. I think it is finding ways to be inclusive. So you have to be, as leaders, we're in roles to be strategic about that approach and to be mindful about the um, insults that we can sometimes indirectly cause. Um, when we went forward with the summit that we just initiated, we even had to be careful about the wording of, of how we approach that conversation because you have people in the community that you represent that are climate defenders and you have those that are deniers and I'm here to serve both sides and I want to hear from both sides. So with that in mind, you set the table that's welcome into every resident that you're serving and just being very mindful of that. And, and Waldo, I think it's hard to get people involved because we hold different events on Saturdays and stuff. And until it actually becomes something that's going to affect them, that's when they come out. So I think that's the hardest is trying to get people in our town that we run into is trying to get them involved and that is it. I think of the other side, in Gainesville, I think it's quite easy to get people involved in climate change. I imagine most of the folks here are in Gainesville and we're very passionate about it. I think what's been, what is hard, and this is hard with all community engagement, is how do you get folks that are not within the traditional groups, uh, like I see a lot of folks in this audience that I've seen a lot of other things. How do you get folks that are not, you know, kind of the, the passionate folks that are interested in this out there? I mean, when you look over the, what we just saw in that presentation as to where climate change is going to impact, I mean, what you see is these low-income minority communities, the same ones that the food insecurity is going to hit, you know, East Gainesville and some of our um, low-income communities more. The heat island effect, I mean, I, 
I, I had seen that map before, but it still shocks me every time I see it, where you see where the heat is going to hit, and it's just, it is a, it is right through East Gainesville, right? And it's um, through these areas that, uh, for, the, for historical reasons, had large roads that got built through there, did not get the tree funds that they needed, but just don't have the kind of infrastructure that's needed. And so how do you ensure that you bring those kind of folks in? Because this is, as you point out, I mean, you're kind of spending money now to ensure a better future in the future, but when there's folks that, when, when you are trying to figure out how you're going to save up enough of your paycheck to pay your GRU bill, to pay your grocery bill, um, you're worried about now. And then so how, balancing all that stuff out is important and getting those folks to the table is, um, is something that we need to continue to work on. So we have a panel of three community leaders here, uh, people who are deeply knowledgeable and have a lot of experience. What questions do you have for them? Um, yes, sir, we'll start there and then you, ma'am. Okay. I asked Brian this question after Will Quinlan's presentation, so you take 10 minutes to prepare. But, but what I saw in that presentation was like 20, in the next 20 to 25 years, we're going to be flooded with people. We won't be enough water to go around. We'll just have so many people coming in, we can't deal with it. At 20, 25 more years after that, it'll be unlivable. You're the low income, as Brian was saying, communities will be hit first and worst. You will just die if you don't have air conditioning. I mean, it's going to be killing temperatures. How do you? How do you make plans? I mean, you mentioned 2080. In 2080, won't be unlivable. How do you, what do you do to get through this or to plan for it for, as, as leaders? Please jump in and, and let me from all three of you. I thought he referenced Brian's name. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 um, uh, yeah, since, since you asked, I mean, how, well, when you would, in fair, when you asked me this, um, I, 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 you saw the look on my face where I said, man, I don't know. I just got through this horrifying presentation about how I should get out of there. Now you're asking me how we're going to fix it. I mean, it, they're not, they're not easy questions, and there's a lot of uncertainty, right? I mean, and I feel like we're entering a time period of, um, and you saw those charts. They had the the worst case scenario, the meet the medium case scenario, the low case scenario. Um, what we can do is continue to try to chip away at a lot of these things. I mean, and and because it touches on so much stuff, it's um, you know we had and and we are in a state that is not particularly um, <laughs> like open to this. So we we had, for instance, you mentioned uh, not being able to to be outside and in air conditioning. We had a renters' rights ordinance where we had a robust team that was going into these kind of low-income houses and saying, do you have a working HVAC system? Are you up to code with that HVAC system? How energy efficient is it? And then we got, that got dismantled by legislative act and we had to find, for all the folks that were working there that were passionate about that work, they were going in there and saying, how do we make people's lives better? And we had to find them in different departments. Um, something like that is important. I mean, you, people have to have a working HVAC system, and that's just for the day-to-day -day stuff, not just the big, how do we do our part to lower greenhouse gas emissions, but how do you ensure, uh, uh, you know, we, we are actively trying to get grants, uh, shout out to the Biden administration for the I, for the uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act, for ARPA. We got a ton of funding that came through that allowed us to open up, uh, to slow down flooding uh, by, by um, it, by opening up some of the creeks and things like that that would be able to move things through. I don't know what the future holds in any of that, but we're just kind of slowly trying to chip away at what we can do to, to move forward with it. But there's no, no easy answers and a lot of uncertainty as to how all this is gonna go forward. And clearly it's not gonna be just gains though, right? Well, well, the, right, the interesting thing on that is too, it's like, you know, as city leaders, how do you grow with respect to keeping it green? Because again, like I said, I was born in Hollywood, I used to, you know, play at the beach and the, pine forest there by the beach and all this stuff and we went back for a convention after I'd already moved and it's all gone. I mean everything's gone. Mm -hmm. And you think about the heat, well you've built all these tall buildings that are blocking the sea breezes. You've built roads that you know reflect heat. Um, and for us we have um, the um, the green space we we have bears, we have you know foxes, deers, tons of stuff and just in our neighborhood. And how do you do the balance where you know, Waldo does need to grow to keep self-sustaining, but how do you keep the animals, how do you find that balance? Because I, I don't see it anywhere. It's either overgrown or desolate. So it's like, so that's my biggest thing is how do we find balance? Because I want to keep the green space. I want to, I love having the animals and stuff, even though the bear gets in the garbage and everything else, but, <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> you know? So I think for, for leaders, that's the, the biggest issue because you want jobs and you want your community to be sustaining, but yet you want it green. So I don't, that's the hard, that's the hard balance. Luckily for us, we have a lot of wetlands, so 
technically you can't build on that. I know people do, but you're not supposed to. <laughs> and the county's helped us with some of that. So, but I think the balance is the hard part. I mean, I read, you know, people pouring into into Hawthorne. How, how do you deal with that? I mean, I think both leaders here today kind of touched on two things that doing it one thing at a time is very important. And I think strategy needs to be doing it at the most vulnerable spot, not at the most easiest. And I, I think that's what we see kind of a lot is approaching the easiest first. And that's not always necessarily the best outcome. So my approach with my city, where you know, I have jurisdiction, would be doing the most vulnerable area first, doing the most vulnerable population first. And that's pretty much all, almost citywide. And then just to add to what Waldo was saying, you go, it is possible to do both. And as leaders, I just left from a national summit in Tampa this morning, because you go, so you go out and you find those cities and places and spaces that are doing what it is that you seek to do. And that they already have models in place. There's nothing under the sun. I mean, even about mosquitoes. There's nothing we didn't hear this week that I couldn't bring back and say, okay, well, this is what we can do here in Hawthorne. This is, you know, the road forward that we want to travel. So as leaders, you never stop learning. So the more we know, the power is still the knowledge. And I, I think um, to go back to a comment that um, Commissioner Eastman said earlier, is that we go in these spaces and have these discussions about climate change and things of those issues, and it's usually the same people. So to me, knock knock, change your approach. And I, I, I love coming here because they pour into me, but then it's like, I need to go and pour into the folks that are not coming to the table and that looks like me or maybe most impacted in my area and say, hey, this is what I have learned. And I have not had no one to turn me down and say, I don't want to hear anything about that because I make it make sense to them. And I think that that's where we're losing energy and losing a lot of momentum is we don't want to take the time to make it make sense to the voters that's not coming in, in the spaces and places. So that's me. Thank you. Um, if not, then could you just introduce yourself briefly before you ask your question? Sure, I'm Janice Gary. I'm president of League of Women Voters and we are we're at your event. Yes. Um, and I, this question's for you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and you kind of just touched on it. You mentioned um, representing deniers as well as climate people who um, accept it's a reality. Um, have you, what effective messaging have you found? What kind of verbiage have you landed on that's effective for speaking to everybody? That's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. I'm just shaking my head because I have since that summit and before, definitely before that summit, that's what it is. What is it about? You know, those words are big and we don't understand it. And, you know, they want the meat and gravy of it. And it's like the meat and gravy of it is your AC has to be on 20, 12 months out of the year now versus years before it did not. So it's just finding the commonality in everyday living that people will come to the table and I can take a defender and make them a champion by just showing them that, hey, we're not that issue in the climate discussion, let's leave it at national, right? Let's leave it at the whole country. But here in Hawthorne, this is what we're championing when it comes to climate initiatives. And it's, it's being able to, to, to control and afford our air pollution. It's being able to upgrade the HVAC systems for our elderly population. It's being able to um, have security, food security in our neighborhoods. It's been able to protect farmers from um, industrial development in our city. It's been a conversation that has gone on and on, but we can just go down the line of different ways. You just make it make sense to the ones that are affected and finding something because it, none of us are without effect. It, it, I mean, even the wealthiest, they still have some type of impact. The gasoline prices are still going up, so they still sit at the dining room table readjusting their budget. It's not a matter of affordability, but they still have to take the time to uh, you know, readjust it and pivot to make it make sense for their entire family. So we all, it's a commonality in every issue in this country. If we could just take the barriers down, take the red and blue capes off, take the desires and the, and the champion defender capes off, and just be people. That's taking care of people. Thank you. We're actually at the end of our time, believe it or not. Um, wow. I'd like to, if it's okay, just ask each of you to give a really brief what message do you want to leave with this group uh, as elected officials and, and, and managers, just very, very briefly before, before they head to another room? Um, can I start with you? I'll go down the line. Yeah, sure. I mean, just thank you guys for being involved and stay involved in all this. It's going to be, um, you know, the city of Gainesville is uh, committed to this, uh, committed to moving forward, uh, finding ways to uh, to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and be resilient. But, you know, it's, it, 
every, everything is going to be harder here in the next couple of years, particularly as we see more of these impacts, particularly as it is, um, you know, as all the changes that are happening both locally and statewide. And so, uh, you know, your support and engagement are going to be more important now than ever before. Thank you. I agree with that, and I agree with what you said too. Just when you talk to people, instead of trying to get an argument with them and you know taking a different approach to to everybody, talking, we all want the same thing in the end. Just how do we get? Any final words? I will just, you know, give a summation of what they both just said. Just keep staying engaged. Um, do not become be patient with the conversation and understand that people may not get it the first time, but that doesn't mean that they are not um, willing to get it. They're not willing to be engaged, but sometimes you just have to take a different approach or giving that extra energy to finding a way to, to, to get that approach to the problem. Thank you all very much. Please do. Just, just say that I like lemon sorbet and, and cut it. <laughs> uh, David Hastings from Sierra Club. He's also a uh, senior level marine scientist. He's done a lot of amazing things. He is the uh, part of the energy committee at the Sierra Club, and um, he's fairly new to Gainesville, and he is very passionate about, about homemade lemon sorbet. Um, I don't have a fun fact about you, Jason. I know, I, I'm not nearly. He's a fun guy. <laughs> <laughs> but J Jason, if any of you are familiar with the Community Weatherization Coalition, and I know some of you definitely are, um, he has been very involved with that. He came to Gainesville in 2008, and I got to know Jason when he was involved with something called Gainesville Loves Mountains, because he came from the Appalachians and was very familiar with the impact of uh, mountaintop removal of coal mining. So um, I'm going to just turn it over now to David and then Jason, and they're going to talk a little bit about carbon footprint in your home. Great. Okay. Well, what a pleasure to be introduced by Commissioner Alford. Um, yeah, we get to celebrate that. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, it's great to live in a county in a place that has such great representation. It's, uh, it's really wonderful. I don't feel the same way about all the the folks who are representing me uh, in this um, right now, but uh, that's a whole different story. So the prompt that Jason and I got was how to save money on energy. So um, I'm a retired climate scientist. I care a lot about climate, and so that has led me to care a lot about energy. And, uh, you know, back in the day when a lot of our houses were built, um, energy was relatively cheap, and we just didn't care that much about it. You could kind of turn whatever you had on. It might be a wood stove or something that burns coal um, and also burns gas or oil. And we just didn't care quite as much. But actually now we care a lot because these energy costs are huge. They're much larger than they used to be. We don't just go out and harvest wood. Instead, we burn things. And it's those burning things that really concerns a lot of us in the community. Uh, you know, everybody in the front of the room, I think in the back of the room, we all care a lot about these greenhouse gases that are being generated. So the prompt is how to save money. And the answer, if there's one answer, it's insulate your roof, uh, your attic, sorry, um, above the ceiling. And I think a lot of you there uh, know what I'm talking about. And so I'm thinking that I'm preaching to the choir, and uh, that's okay, because the choir has to then sing to the congregation, inspire the congregation. So I'm going to um, just, yeah, uh, thanks for, thanks for uh, taking it all in. So insulate your attic. That's really important. If it's already done, insulate it more. Um, so when I moved to my, into my house in St. Pete, there was a little thin layer of, you know, something like that. I got the utility to come in for a couple hundred dollars, blowing cellulose, easy, fast, cheap, and it made a huge difference in my bill. Um, later on, about four years later, I decided, well, let's do that again. Again, it made a big difference. Every house I've lived in, um, I've put in more insulation in the attic. That's the one thing you worry about, in part, because heating and cooling costs, uh, it, uh, accounts for about half of our energy bill in our home. So kind of focus on that. Um, I also really love nice windows, but it turns out that if you care about costs, your windows aren't gonna um, save a lot of energy, excuse me, save a lot of money compared to how much they cost. 
That said, what I did when I moved into the house here in Gainesville, we replaced all the windows. It was really expensive and it was fantastic. It made a huge difference. So if your only concern is cost, you can leave the windows alone for a little while. But I also buy a couch. I bought a nice couch at one point, 25 years ago. It lasts a long time. Buy good windows, they'll really be nice. But that's not what you want to worry about, about cost. So um, let's see, in terms of what insulation to choose, there's the blown-in cellulose, that's cheap. The, um, the alternative to that generally is rolled fiberglass. That's easier to do on your own. So if you're gonna roll it out in the attic by yourself, do that alone. And um, there's some uh, you, you know, YouTube videos you might wanna check out. They're pretty, pretty useful, my old house or something like that. So um, that's the one thing I'm gonna ask you to take home, insulate your attic. And, and pass that on, because that's really important. It's not small stuff, it's big stuff. Um, what else? The alternative is to simply use less energy, turn down the thermostat uh, in the winter, turn up the thermostat in the summer. You wanna be comfortable, but uh, you can really save a lot of energy. It's about, uh, for every degree Fahrenheit you change it, it's about a 10%, 10 to 15% savings. So that's, um, that, that's a big difference. Ceiling fans make a massive difference. Um, uh, if Cold, if air is being blown at you, you'll feel cooler, even if the temperature is the same. Now that ceiling fan won't make any difference if you're not in the room, so turn it off as you leave. Ceiling fans are, are, are fantastic. Um, lower that hot water heater. Doesn't need to be 140 degrees. Dial it down to 120, you'll be fine. Um, and what else? What do I do? I think I'm up to, for time, we're being really good. Um, <laughs> Let's see, uh, I do all the laundry in the household because I do it in cold water. Detergents are designed for 65 degree Fahrenheit water. We have 70 degree Fahrenheit water. You don't need hot water to, to run your clothes. So that's it, pass it over to Jason and then we'll answer some questions. So um, Mary mentioned um, I'm a volunteer with the Community Weatherization Coalition. Um, any folks here not familiar with the CWC and what we do? All right, well, um, if you haven't already, please have us come out to your home and do a volunteer free energy tune-up on your home. Um, we'll help you identify ways that you can save water and save energy in your house and lower those utility bills. Um, if you have already done it, hopefully you found it to be a valuable, enjoyable experience, come volunteer with us. We've got a table right outside there and uh, we'd love to have you involved. So um, one of the biggest things that we do, I kind of think of uh, us as sort of um, utility bill whisperers. We sit down with people and look at their bill with them and help them figure out the ways that their home is using energy and water and how they can save money, okay? So um, in addition to just understanding their bill, because sometimes the bills can be kind of complicated, we wanna help people understand where their energy dollars and their water dollars are going, okay? So think about your average home. Uh, what are the th sort of three big ways that you're using electricity in your home? David hinted at some of these already. What are the th sort of three big ones in your home? HVAC. HVAC, huge, uh, right? Another one? Hot water heater. Hot water heater, huge, okay. And the third one? Electronics. Electronics can be a big one, especially the ones that you sort of leave in and they're just kind of using phantom loads all the time. Food. Uh, food, did you say food? Yeah. yeah, food, totally, right? So your fridge is a big one. And then of course like your cooking and stuff like that. So yeah, those are, those are some big ones. Um, and then what about water? What are some big ways that the average consumer uses a lot of water in their home? Toilets. Toilets is a huge one inside the house. Irrigation. Irrigation. I pulled a quote from Stacy actually, <laughs> for today's presentation. What percentage of people's water they use for irrigation? 50 to 60. 50 to 60 percent, okay? So right there, I mean, bam, if you can find a way to knock off 50 to 60 percent of your water consumption, that's absolutely huge, right? Um, so helping people identify those big ways that they're spending money and then ways that they can reduce down, save the environment and save money. That's a win-win, right? The last thing I want to talk about a bit, um, and this is a way, well, okay, before that, I, I brought a piece of paper in with me last time because I only had one copy to pass around to folks, um, and it had the, um, the rebates that are available for making um, investments in your home to get new energy efficient appliances and things like that. 
Um, we don't know how much longer those tax credits are gonna be around because of administration change. So I highly encourage people to try to take advantage of those as quickly as possible. Unfortunately, I only brought one copy and somebody left with it last time. So if you don't already have that information, this is my information here. Just uh, shoot me an email or phone number and I'll email it to you. But I really recommend, while the money is there, to make these kind of investments in your home, do it now. And that can be getting a, a nice, efficient water heater. Um, you know, there's a whole nice range of things on there that you can do, including even things like upgrading your electrical. Um, th that's included in these tax credits. Now, if you're doing it for the purposes of, say, getting solar on your home or, uh, you know, high efficiency appliances, that sort of thing. So anyway, um, definitely hit me up if you want that information. And then the last thing I'll say, um, I, I'm probably not the best person to talk to folks about sort of lifestyle changes, because for me, the number one most important thing that we can all do to sort of reduce our impact and, and help on this journey to addressing climate change is to get involved, to actually get out of your house and go get involved with great organizations like the Sierra Club, like the CWC, we have a table out there, get involved with some of the initiatives that the county and the city have got going on. Um, and I say that for a couple reasons. One is because I think inequity is incredibly central to this issue of addressing climate change and, and wider issues. So Mary mentioned I have some, some roots in Appalachia. I saw firsthand living there what it means for folks when you devalue people, you devalue the place that they live. And it allows you to do really destructive things like mountaintop removal for the comfort of people in other places, right? So we have to address inequity. In our own community, we can see the inequity play out in housing stock in this community. There are some people here that are paying tremendously higher utility bills than others simply by virtue of where they live, their income level. So we have to address issues like inequity. And then the other thing I always think about in terms of like changing societal defaults, okay? So we take this room, for instance. Um, we had this big campaign at UF for years and years, trying to get people to remember to turn off the light. We had stickers up everywhere, turn off the lights, do, you know, whatever. People still didn't necessarily always remember to turn off the lights. So what do we do instead? Now we put sensors in the room. So even if that person leaves on Friday night, forgets to turn the lights off, that sensor is gonna recognize that they're not here and they're gonna turn the lights off. Similarly, city of Gainesville, what they did with getting rid of plastic straws, for me now when I go to other places and I have plastic straws, I'm like, oh, good Lord, what are you doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So just that change, making that change in a local ordinance like that, think about how many plastic straws we've diverted from the ocean, from the landfills, all that sort of thing. So changing those societal defaults is, is a hugely important thing to me. And with that, I think we'll use the remainder of our time for comments, questions. Yeah, and, and, I, 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 and I'm gonna just say a couple of real quick things since we are, this, what they got said, what was on the schedule were kind of different. So if you wanna talk a little bit about what the um, things are that you can do to reduce your carbon footprint that aren't energy related, thinking hard about how you eat, where your food comes from, thinking hard about what you buy, if you need that, living with less consumption, and finally, what you throw away. Can that, is that still usable by you or somebody else? It's consumption is a huge part of our carbon footprint. I just ran a carbon neutral campaign when I calculate my carbon footprint. It was all, it wasn't about how I drove my car to go somewhere. It was about the things I bought. It was about the things that I had printed. So consumption is the hugest part of that. Uh, when you think about uh, insulation in your attic, look into radiant barriers. If you want to talk about being uh, uh, comfortable in your home with an air conditioner, the number one thing in Florida is managing humidity. The humidity is managed when your air conditioner is running. Running your air conditioner costs way less energy than having your air conditioner start and stop. Think about your car. Every time you start the motor, you use a lot more energy than when your motor is running. So the best air conditioners stay on. They don't start or stop. And because they're on, they're removing the humidity all the time and you're more comfortable. So anyway, um, and of course maintenance. You know, you can have the best hot water heater in the world, but if you don't drain it and get all the lime out of it periodically, it's going to burn up the elements and use a crap ton of electricity. So anyway, questions. We have a few more minutes. Yes. So I'm, I'm going to put a quick plug in for the Empower Coalition. Everyone got their bags. Oh, nice. Um, so the Empower Coalition, which the city, the county, uh, CWC, uh, NAACP have all been trying to work together to reduce energy burdens in our uh, neighborhoods. Uh, 
Porter, uh, sorry, Duval neighborhood, Swag, uh, or just a couple of the two neighbors that we've been working on trying to reduce the energy burden neighborhoods there. Um, we've been looking to get grant funds, so I'm really glad that to see members out here, um, and especially mentioning and talking about East Gainesville. Uh, I do have a couple of specific questions since you talked about insulation. I've been looking at potentially throwing insulation in the roof. Um, have you heard of, because you didn't mention spray foam insulation, that was a type that I was thinking of doing. It seals the entire attic. It's, it's not just, and so, and so I wanted to get an, uh, you know, any feedback on it because a lot of it's been layering, putting cellulite, you know, and, and every company that came out had their own version of this is the best, this is what you should use, and they were all different because they were all wrapping different things. But I was always curious about the spray foam insulation for the attic as opposed to the other, like the cellulite insulations. Now, let me take a moment. Um, it's, it's very effective, and the greenhouse gas potential of the foam that you're putting on there is over the top. It depends on the foam. Well, um, uh, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> but it's very, very high. So I just, we just built an addition. I moved into my wife's home. It was a 2-1, made it a 3-2 so that we could get along. Um, we did the spray foam insulation because it's so effective. Um, and yeah, as, as Mary said, you really want to choose the right thing, but the information on the, dip, these are proprietary compounds, chemicals, and it's on, you know, it's, it's it, yeah, it's hard to know. I have a close friend who's a, uh, you know, the head lawyer for the lead building folks in DC, and she is not using it in her new, you know, her new uh, uh, nice house, little house that she's it, doing. So it, don't you lose your crawl space and you can't do maintenance later? Or no, 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 you, you still have your crawl space. space. So we can, we have uh, access into our attic uh -huh. and you can still walk around, but there is some foam oh, up there. Oh, you spray it up against the roof. That's yeah. correct, oh, yeah. 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 It is, it is great, it's, so, it's yeah. controversial. A few comments that I will tell you if you are considering it. Um, go, uh, speaking of LEED, they have a really good rating system for all the different foam insulations and they don't just talk about the insulated value, but they talk about the impact on the environment. Secondly, if you need to replace your roof in the next 10 years, wait, replace your roof and then put in the spray foam because it's going to affect the roof deck and most new roofs they require you to replace the roof deck and that's a mess. The third great thing is, is spray foam roofs are wonderful in hurricane environments because they kind of glue the whole house together. Yeah. So those are three things to think about, but any, and more questions. I want us to say the words many split. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wanted to say those words too. I installed in the Al Albuquerque in a, in a um, bed and breakfast. They have 13 rooms. They could heat and cool one room for both guests. And it, you know, saving so much money. I'm an electrical contractor, and my good customer got me, he made me install them. And I was like, holy crap, we could, we could do it. You could watch YouTube and know how to do it. It's yeah, well, heat, heat pumps are magic mm -hmm. because rather than producing heat, they take heat from one place and put it into another. Even if it's like a 20 degree Fahrenheit place, they can take heat out of that and put it into your home. So it's really, heat pumps are really fantastic. Well, I'm a huge fan of mini splits because you can, if you have an older air conditioner unit, you can't afford to replace it. You can put in a mini split and a lot of times it will take you through the shoulder months of the year and you only have to run your system um, during the hottest and coldest months of the year, which can you know extend the life of your system by years. I have, I moved into my house, immediately the AC went kaputs and it's an old house, it wasn't a good installed system, so I lived without it until I could install a few mini splits. And I have three mini splits, my bill is less than half than it was when I had the other one, and it heats and cools my house just fine at a fraction of the cost. The thing is, is you're not taking air and spending a lot of money to cool it and push it around and then push it through the hottest part of your house to get to where it needs to go, right? We still air condition our homes like it's a retrofit. And many splits are how, that's how Europe has been doing it for decades. So um, we really need to rethink uh, air conditioning in this country. But um, anyway, uh, we really are out of time, but if you have one more question, all good? All right, well, thank you all. Please thank our uh, presenters. Five.
five minutes to make it there. <laughs> Let's take your seats. We're going to get started here. Well, yeah, it, it'll be a That's the one thing I can figure out. But okay. maybe, maybe not, actually. It, it keeps going on and off. So, you know, it's no, I think that's it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Let's get seated, everybody. We're going to kick this off again. Uh, we had some great breakout sessions. Uh, just now, I was able to peek into a couple of them, and um, this issue of plan, climate anxiety came out in a couple of them. I know we all kind of, it's impossible not to feel some anxiety after hearing presentations like the one Bill Quinlan made earlier, but I think that um, what brings me hope and brings me inspiration is the young people that are involved in this issue, and we have uh, two of those young people uh, here today. Sofia Villalaz is a UF student studying political science, sustainability studies, and economics. She successfully revised the Gainesville chapter of the Sunrise Movement and was one of the founders of the Green New Deal for UF campaign. If you don't know about that, look it up. It's pretty cool. Sophia has interned at the Environmental Protection Department for over a year, developing the county's climate action plan. And earlier this year, she was awarded the Utah Scholarship uh, for her efforts. Jubal Haskeller is a climate justice activist who is interested in climate psychology and other environmental social science, sciences. She's a lifelong Gainesville resident and a freshman at the University of Florida. Welcome to the book. Thank you. Thank you for having us here. But to be completely honest, I wish we didn't have to be making this speech right now. We have known about climate change for decades, and yet it still hasn't been addressed with the urgency required. So as young people, we are curious. It's hard to encapsulate the reasons why we're angry and scared into a few short paragraphs, but the most blatantly obvious one is that we feel as though we've been left to clean up a mess that we didn't make. And I hope you all feel the same way, because you didn't cause this crisis either. I think many of you in the audience can resonate with our anger and ask yourselves why didn't countries, governments, or those in power take action sooner? Reasons such as money, power, and maintaining the status quo come to mind. A status quo that will cost us so much more than any money you can make from not taking action against one of the biggest crises this world has ever seen. So, it is this inaction that makes us angry. But we're more than angry, we're scared. And now Tupelo from Sunrise Movement will explain why. As young people, we're also terrified because we have seen firsthand the impacts of climate change. And we're scared about even worse scenarios that are barreling towards us. We are also deeply heartbroken and sad about all the things we've already lost and what we still might lose. And I'm not just pulling that from nowhere. There are studies that have surveyed thousands of young people around the world, and these are all common feelings that emerge. We're also pretty pessimistic about our futures. One of these global surveys found that 75% of young people feel that the future is frightening. And that is not okay. We should not have to feel that way. But it is also essential that we all embrace our anger, sadness, and fear, because that is a healthy response. It shows that we care. And so now Sophia is going to talk about what our generation is doing to take action. I bet you weren't expecting so much pessimism before lunch. But, <laughs> but I think what I've seen from my generation is not purely pessimism. I've seen our generation transform our anger, frustration, and fear into action. Instead of clinging onto false hope, we get angry, and we push for the changes we want to see in the world. Let me tell you one thing about our generation. When we're angry, we let you know. You've all seen Greta and the masses of youth who organize walkouts, protests, and boycotts. You see us fill our social media pages with calls to action, fundraisers, and events aimed at spreading awareness and organizing campaigns. You see us turn all of our emotions into tangible action, like pushing for the Inflation Reduction Act and the American Climate Corps. And we're not gonna ignore the elephant in the room. We know that a lot of what we've worked for and accomplished are currently at threat. So we need to ensure that our politicians at the local, state, and federal level hear us and know that what their constituents, constituents demand of them. We can't give up or give in to dismay. 
We need to keep fighting for climate action no matter what. But like my peer said, this isn't a responsibility that should be solely on the sh shoulders of youth. It is going to take every one of us to change the status quo. And it is going to take a lot of courage, organizing, demanding, and yes, anger, to make palpable differences in our world. And now Tupelo is going to explain to you all what you can do as citizens to address climate change. Uh, looking at the agenda, you can see that this talk is called Why This Matters. And at this point, you might be wondering how our generation's anger, fear, and organizing are tied into that. Well, for starters, it is our anger and frustration that push us to challenge the status quo. We get fed up with the way things are and demand change. We cannot ignore what's at stake. So if you're angry about the current situation, we want you to embrace that anger and turn it into something productive, something that will catalyze the change we want to see in the world. And of course, we acknowledge that not everyone can spend hours every week organizing and protesting, but that doesn't mean you can't contribute in different ways. Find something that you're passionate about, what you're good at, what makes you happy, and even if you can only commit so much time to it, it's better than not acting. When each person takes action, it builds meaningful, collective change. We also encourage everyone here to take time during our breaks to look at the tables of organizations outside. We have so many organizations that you can get involved with, and getting involved in these groups makes our community stronger. We want to thank you all for taking the time to listen to us, and we hope that you keep listening to us, because we're going to be as loud as possible until we see the change that we deserve. around there's a lot of us so it's going to take a while to get everybody their food so what I recommend is to take the advice and go visit some of the vendors some people go ahead and get in line but rather than spending 40 minutes waiting in line why don't you talk to your neighbors here and find ways to get involved we're going to start back up at 12:45 in here and learn about the climate action plan if you are one of those people that got late in the line and you still have a plate of food, bring it in here and eat while you learn. So um, the food is back where the coffee has been and it's from custom caterers in Mikanopi and a lot of it is locally sourced. So we can start to um, practice the work teaching. So thank you all.
that advisory committee since the start. So I appreciate all their dedication and time. If all of you are interested in what you're hearing and want to be involved, we are going to start releasing the chapters of the Climate Action Plan to that committee for review. So if you're interested in attending those meetings, there are uh, the third Monday of every month, and starting in January, we're going to start releasing uh, the chapters that are most close to being completed. Uh, and we will continue that process probably through March and April, um, trying to get those drafts to a point where we will then have a workshop with our county commissioners and hopefully toward an adoption uh, later in 2025. So the, the general outline for the plan was we were targeting, originally we had 10 chapters we were looking at. Um, here are the, the chapters listed here. As you can see, they cover uh, almost everything county government does. Um, we had climate migration as one of those chapters, but we are going to integrate climate migration into the kind of introductory aspects. And, and for those of you who don't know what I mean by climate migration, that's the movement of people due to climate impact. So as, as Bill mentioned, we are expecting people to move away from the coast. Um, based on those projections, we are estimating practically doubling our population by 2100 in Alaska County. So climate is actually going to likely increase our population projections in the years ahead. The only thing that might change that is you know, an economic crisis in the state of Florida, um, most likely from insurance and other aspects. But if, if the, the state stays stable, we're going to be growing significantly. And that's going to have a big impact on, on how we address our issues. The other thing I want to point out is we'll see an equity chapter. And the reason is equity is engaged in all of our aspects related to these chapters. So there is an equity component in every single one of these chapters. So they're, they're going to have a goal, an equity chapter, they're going to have a target and action items associated, and data and analysis to back up why we believe those are important actions. So basically the theme of the plan is going to include equity. In fact, the map to the right is an example of um, the area in blue or, or surveyed or the results of a survey that was done, and this is where those people were located. Uh, in the next presentation, we'll talk a little bit about the results of that survey. And then the area hat, is, I guess from your view, it, it, you can't tell it's hash, it kind of looks um, kind of yellow-orange. That are disadvantaged neighborhoods based on the federal climate and economic justice screening tool. So as you can see, we hit a lot of the areas um, of, of where citizens are most at risk to the climate, but we will continue to reach out to those communities. We're also going to have baseline and targets. Uh, I think you need to have a target to understand what you're trying to accomplish, and we're going to be including those. We're looking back at the past and what we're currently doing to address climate, and a lot of the ideas you're going to hear are actually things we've already initiated, um, and we are going to integrate climate into those strategies. And so probably the biggest thing and maybe what most of us want to talk about is well, what are our future strategies, what are our action items that we're going to put in place to prepare us for what is in time. So I'll first talk on a big scale. So these are an example of three large scale assessments that we are initiating this year. Uh, the first one is a follow up of our climate vulnerability analysis. That was a large scale analysis which Bill described in his presentation. The next step, we got a grant from the Zone of Florida, and I believe we've already locked in that money, so we should still receive that. And it's this plan to look at the critical infrastructure that's vulnerable and determine how we need to adjust, move, rebuild, construct, and support and protect that critical infrastructure. So that's a plan we're going to be implementing through this year. We're going to also update our greenhouse gas inventory. We've done that five years ago. We're going to continue to do that every five years. So we're, we're, we're targeting our infrastructure to help us with resiliency. And the greenhouse gas report is going to help us figure out what we can do to mitigate our impacts on climate. So this is focused on uh, carbon, greenhouse gases that we put in the air. This report tells us where it's coming from, who are the big impactors, and what we can do to focus in on those areas to reduce our impacts. And then in addition to that, we're going to do a 
community forest management plan. Uh, what that will do is it's gonna evaluate our current tree canopy in the diversity of our, our tree and forest communities in Alachua County. That will, we're gonna use that information to figure out how much trees we need to plant, where to plant them, how to reduce the um, urban heat effect where there's not enough trees, there's too much pavement. Uh, I think Bill hit on that. That's where you know temperatures can be 10, 15, 20 degrees hotter than what you're hearing on, on the news about the weather. Those areas get really hot. So we need to focus on, on, on those areas of the county. We have some really large initiatives. Some of these we've started, and I'll quickly go through each of these. This is an example of six of those, but they're uh, large efforts that the county is under working on today. So one of them is what we call the 30 by 30 plan. This idea is actually being looked at nationally. It was one of Biden's administration's efforts to protect 30% of our land and water by the year 2030. And to understand the idea there, that's just the minimum commitment we need to do to protect the essential ecological services that these natural areas provide to buffer against the worst impacts of climate change. So it alone is not gonna be enough. On the image to the right is by county, the amount of land protected. So if any of the shades are green on the map, then they're at least 30% or more, they reach that. Most of the counties that have green are based on most likely the federal lands, federal forests, federal parks that are in place that kind of get them to that point. Um, yellow is probably the most common color. Those are counties between 20 and 30% today. So Alachua County, for those of you who might be geographically um, challenged, <laughs> is this area right here. Um, as you can see, we're yellow. Um, as many of you know, we have a really um, great conservation program in place. We've had it since 2000, um, but we still have a ways to go. And we are currently at about 23% set aside. And that's with the help of our partners at the state, nonprofits, um, and, and others who've set aside land. So to, to accomplish that, we need to get 43,000 more acres protected. We have a Wild Spaces Public Places program in place, the Lodge County Forever Program. Um, and the Environmental Department is in charge of trying to obtain conservation lands to get us to this point. And um, to give you how, how much of a challenge this will be, I think the, the program is at about 35,000 acres since 2000. So it took us 25 years to get 35,000 acres. We have seven, eight, six years to try to get 43,000. So we've got to find additional strategies to do this. Um, and it's not just about how much we protect, it's where and what we're protecting. So we want to protect wildlife corridors to maximize the potential for those lands to be useful for, for wildlife movement. Protecting wetlands and floodplains are key, not only to, to protect uh, for, for benefits of water, but they also help with flood issues, uh, protecting the imperiled species in the diverse habitats as well. But we are also looking now at ag conservation strategies. We need to include ag if we're gonna get that. And the county's just initiated a ag protection strategies that we're going to be targeting um, ag, ag landowners who are willing to want to preserve their lands. They're gonna to get to put a conservation easement on that land and be able to transfer those properties to future generations. Um, so working with the ag community is gonna be key to reaching that goal. So, we, we saw this image uh, in, in Bill's presentation with the threats above, the vulnerabilities, and the social impact. When we think about land conservation, why is this important? Well, it's protecting all these categories. It's protecting us against hotter, uh, drier days. It helps definitely with flood control. Um, if done right, wildfire, and improves with health, uh, water quality, um, and, and economic it helps against economic crime. When we add ag into the mix, we are adding some of the same features, but we're also now adding, you know, reducing, addressing the issue of reduced food supply. So it, it's one of our keystone efforts toward um, climate resiliency. When we look at um, comprehensive plan, 
Um, raise your hand if you know what a comprehensive plan is. Okay, I didn't want, I didn't know whether I need to explain that too much, but it's basically the vision, the guiding vision for the, the county in, in what we do to plan for uh, future development as well as what our strategies are within our, our county government. It includes land use, transportation, housing, stormwater, conservation and open space, solid waste, economics, energy, intergovernmental coordination, historic, uh, community health, public schools, and capital improvement. So you can see why it's important for us to integrate our climate strategies into that plan. Because that plan is the guiding uh, tool we use to, to write our land development regulations, our building code, and um, other aspects of how we administer our government. We have a really interesting program right now in place. This is uh, known as an Empower Coalition. It is a coalition of local governments like the county and the city of Gainesville, nonprofits, small business and neighborhood groups, um, academic institutions like Santa Fe and UF. Um, it's spearheaded by a Lateral County branch of the NAACP. And it's facilitated through a technical assistance grant we got from Communities Sleep which is a Department of, of Energy program, and, and it's also, we've been received a lot of assistance from the Renewable Energy Laboratories from the Department of Energy as well. So the idea with Empower is to, um, and by the way, I think we just submitted, or we are about to submit the grant, and is it, what was the grant? $13 million grant, and the strategy is, and we're about to just submit it now, the strategy is it'll allow us to put solar on institutional roofs, like our schools, universities, county buildings. The money we, we save from those solar panels will then be integrated into community weatherization efforts to help those people in the community that are most in need of improvements to their homes or help lower their energy bills as well. So, I think it's a really fascinating, really effective program, and um, I, I'm really confident I think we're going to get this grant. Um, because a lot of times they were said, we just put solar panels on anyone's roof. Well, there are homes today that are not built to withstand that, or they have covered in tree canopy. The, the best approach to help those individuals is to improve the weatherization of their home. Another one is local mitigation strategy. This is a uh, program that's administered by our emergency management. And what it does is it looks at uh, and builds on the, the hazards in which we're gonna experience. And it sets out a guide for, for our, our uh, government in terms of how we are gonna address those hazards. This is a very common uh, aspect for us already with our hurricanes, uh, which is probably the most frequently uh, current situation we're dealing with with hazards. But, it's going to be updated. Sorry about that. It's going to be updated um, in 2026, and it's going to integrate our climate action plans into that local mitigation strategy. A, a new program that we just kicked off a week or two ago. I think it's a really exciting uh, program. Is it's called Focus Forward Focus, and it's a three-year initiative to look at. Um, the eastern third of Alachua County. So the area in green is the area that we're, we're targeting. And what we're gonna do there is look at economic development, community services, infrastructure, quality of life, and see how we can help that area of the county get established and, and get um, some economic prosperity. And I think infrastructure is gonna be a really key component of that. And we're gonna look at that through the climate lens as well. Another program that we had a, a meeting just two days ago, two or three days ago, was the, Electro, the Bicycle and Ped Master Plan and the Safe Streets and Roads for All Action Plan. So this is looking at um, our transportation, our infrastructure associated with trying to improve the pedestrian and, and bicycle network in the county, which, you know, as we talked about, with some of our challenges with, with infrastructure and congestion and the idea that we're gonna have a heck of a lot more people here real soon, um, we need to diversify our ability to get around and move around. 
And so we have this initiative kicking off as well, um, and we will also be um, looking at that through a climate commitment. So let, let's talk a little bit about what's going to be in these chapters. So if we start with energy, um, three major factors is looking at a pra um, practicing energy conservation. And so this is referring to energy used by changing behaviors and habits. So the work will involve education and information campaigns di directed at the public as well as county employees, basically finding ways to behavior changes to reduce energy. Another one is maximizing energy efficiency. This involves more about technology um, to find ways to do the same process as reducing energy use or integrating passive up, um, design principles into new construction and major renovations. And then finally, uh, promotion of uh, renewable energy refers to energy generation um, through uh, sources that are renewable like solar, solar environment. So if you look at the, the bottom, currently in our comprehensive plans, we have a goal to reach 100% of our energy for county facilities to come from solar um, by 2030. Uh, we're in 2025 approaching, so um, that's going to be a challenge. We're not there. And then the the an interim target is 50% by 2025. I think we are currently at 31% if you include biomass. So that does it. The solar end um, is a very small part. So that is going to be something we're going to have to be working towards. Because the challenge here is um, equity in the energy burden most of this community is dealing with. If you have a high energy burden, that basically means that you're spending over 6% of your income on your energy bill alone. It's considered severe energy burden if you're spending over 10%. And looking at this map, 22 of these quadrants, in, which are um, census blocks, are under a high or severe energy burden. What that means is everyone in that, they're paying 85% more than most Americans for their energy. Um, so it, it's something we need to tackle. But as we also heard earlier, we have a lot of resources in this community. And there are opportunities. Um, you probably heard from some of those groups today. There are opportunities out there to help those who need help with their energy bill to find ways to reduce um, their burden and improve their homes and where they live. So that's, there are lots of resources out there. When we look at extreme weather, and typically um, this could be hurricanes, heat, could even include cold, flooding, and so on. We all know that typically these events cause significant property damage. They can impact our critical resources like roads and hospitals, and can delay our ability to get back to work, which can lead to economic loss. You can maybe be directly impacted from these events and be displaced and there's definitely concern with public health and safety. So if we look at flooding first, here's some of the ideas we have in the plan that we're producing. It's to increase protection of floodplains. Um, these floodplains are going to get bigger with these bigger storms. So why not consider not allowing building on these floodplains? It, consider those floodplains that have large watersheds, maybe consider setbacks and buffers because those, those floodplains are the most likely to increase in size over time. So even though you might be out of the floodplains today, that floodplain is going to shift and grow. So that's another concept we're considering. Uh, promoting what we refer to as multifunctional landscapes and low impact development strategies. Multifunctional, basically imagine we have a soccer field today. That soccer field could be built to receive flooding uh, stormwater from a major event. It won't, it won't be flooded all the time, but when we do have a major event, if we can design that field to take that storm, then we aren't getting that water in our homes. We aren't getting it covering the roads. We're getting it utilized on that landscape. So finding ways to integrate and have these landscapes multifunctional is a really big push. And the low impact development is a strategy of tackling that 
rainwater at its source, capturing it where we can before it makes its way to the stormwater pond at the end of the bottom of the hill. If you can do that, that stormwater pond is going to have a higher capacity for keeping dirty water from going into that pond. In case we have situations like sinkhole forms, which is a common occurrence, especially on the, the, the western side of the county, if we can capture water, clean it, and make it a functional use in our landscapes, in our um, construction ideas, and um, Innovation Hub is a, a right across the street, a great example of where they integrated stormwater right into their their design and its amenity. Uh, we tend to think of stormwater because we want to get rid of it as soon as possible. We ought to be considering reusing that water integrated into our, our landscaping and consider um, making, finding ways to, to increase our stormwater capacity. And then obviously it's critical that we protect our critical infrastructure. When we think about, uh, we talk about droughts and the impact of wildfire. This map is where our, we call our urban uh, wildland interface. Everything in blue is places where homes, structures, commercial areas are in close contact to areas that could be at risk for wildfires. So the, the, the current map is about half as much blue as this one. This is the 2100 map. So we need to focus on addressing that potential risk by managing our natural areas, allowing prescribed burning programs to be implemented, maintained, um, looking at the, the silviculture lands that dominate the eastern side of the county. Um, where you have that urban interface, use what we call fire-wise landscaping strategies. What that is is if there is a potential wildfire heading into your subdivision, your landscaping isn't going to help promote and move that wildfire through your, your subdivision. It's designed strategically to try to end that fire as it reaches your community. Um, we haven't talked about invasive species other than mosquitoes, but all of those species in South Florida are going to make their way up here as we have warmer uh, winters. And invasive species like kobe grass and, and other species will intensify fires to the point where they'll get up into the canopies and we lose control of those wildfires. So controlling invasive species is, is going to be a, a big challenge for us. And then continue that strong coordination we have with the Division of Forestry, um, our local fire department, and our land managers. So we are looking at um, creating an extreme temperature plan. I think I've already heard people talking about that. We are going to be working on that as integrated into this action plan. And it's going to support um, outdoor workers, farm workers, health and safety concerns, um, looking at best management practice to address those issues. Um, that, that may mean adjusting when they work, where they work. Obviously, if you work on a roof, we don't want to work in at night. That's not safe. So there's going to be some scenarios where just better breaks, better protection of those work, workers, especially farm workers, is going to be key. Where we have a lot of intensive urban development, like the area we are here, looking at areas where we know there's a heat island impact to that area. By the way, our vulnerability analysis identifies those areas, so we know where they are. Loading that tree canopy strategy from our urban management plan is one of the ways we're going to do that. Um, Looking at our surfaces, dark surfaces absorb and hold heat and intensify that, that heat island impact. So lighter surface material, pervious pavement, instead of impervious, what that means is it allows water to, to run through it and um, can help reduce that increase in temperature. Covered parking, where, where we don't have options for trees, even a better bank would have possibly solar integrated into those covered parking areas. Uh, I heard um, some discussion earlier today about the concerns about not even our workers, but our children playing, or, or the parents watching those children play. Those outdoor games and those events, when, when we have temperatures at 110 or a heat index of 110 plus, we should not be out there. Um, and even if us as parents find shade, we gotta remember our kids are out there in the middle of that field. Um, and kids and elderly are much more receptive to heat impacts than, than um, middle aged and, and older, older children. Uh, so looking at that, looking at the protection of our forest and wetlands, um, those areas can help control heat, 
Uh, they also work toward uh, holding back water uh, from our infrastructure as well. And then um, we did have a map earlier of the cooling center's locations. Uh, here's the heat index map. So what this map was, and, and both didn't go into a lot of detail, but these are areas that are recognized to have a heat index concern, so they tend to be a little bit more developed. Those are probably the darkest areas. They also are where a lot of our children go to school, or our elderly live, and also our, uh, our community members who have less income, and so they are less likely to be able to withstand those hot nights, those hot days, and if they can't turn on the AC, they're gonna have some, some major health concerns. So when you look at the location of our cooling centers, by the way, these are the 14 libraries we have in Alaska County. Those are what are currently designated as our, um, our cooling center locations. And the idea there is that these have um, obviously AC, they have large spaces, they have internet options, and what we are, what we need to make sure is they also have a constant energy source, so they need to have a generator. Um, those are three aspects that should be part of any uh, cooling center, or maybe you want to call it a resiliency of location. They, they actually are somewhat well placed in where they are, but clearly they're, they're nowhere near where they need to be, so that is something we will be looking at as well. Uh, land use and transportation, here's a couple things we're looking at is the transportation and mobility districts. These are areas where we, we know there's a lot of aspects, uh, a lot of work, where a lot of people live and trying to figure out how to increase that pedestrian and, and bike network is key. Uh, looking at, we are expecting obviously more electric vehicles to be on the roads. We lack good infrastructure for those electric vehicles. We need to be looking at what we're putting in EV stations. Um, in promoting um, electric vehicle use. And then finally, uh, a term we call climate conscious development or maybe climate ready development. And what that is is our home structure. What are we building today? Are we thinking about what those homes and what those buildings are gonna be looking like and, and having us live in those in the years to come? Every home, should be solar ready. Even if we can't put solar on there, at some point we might. They should be designed in a way to at least make it easily compatible to put solar on there. Um, what we like to call Florida weather-based design. You know, Florida, as Phil said, it tends to be relatively warm. We don't have a lot of cold weather, so how can you get, how is your home designed if your AC is not on? What what would you want to do? You want to have maybe a porch, you can at least sleep out on the porch, might be a little bit cooler. Um, you know, are the surfaces of your roof white so that they don't absorb heat and get hotter in the house? There's a lot of things we can do in our building code design to look at ways to make these homes safer um, when you get these higher extremes. In other words, energy and water efficiency, uh, certification groups, this reduces how much energy and water we need for the basic uses of the, our homes. Uh, Multifunctional open space, I mentioned that already. We need to move away from permanently irrigated landscapes. I, I do believe in 10, 20 years we are gonna look back on when we used to, when we used to water our yards, and go, why are we putting water on our grass only to cut it? Um, there are better uses for water, for our agriculture, for food, for, for drinking, and for, you know, personal hygiene. Those are what we should be using water. We shouldn't be putting it on surfaces that aren't providing food for us. So, you know, looking at ways to have deriving is just, just as beautiful a landscape that doesn't require permanent irrigation. And then looking at strategies to allow communities to have community gardens so that they can grow their own food and, and start to learn more about where their food comes from. Because I think that's a really critical component if you want the community to understand where, um, how hard it can be to grow food and how important that is, you're gonna get, get a better understanding of how to, um, how to address those concerns with, with um, agriculture and uh, local food security. A little bit on water resources action items. We actually have a really long list in this chapter of some ideas, these are just some of them. Promoting, again, resilient landscapes. These are landscapes that can support themselves without us having to add fertilizer and water to the system. 
Um, look at improving the consumptive use permit at the state level. The state determines how much water um, commercial ag and others can, can pull out of the ground. And there's not a lot of, um, currently there's not a, a lot of process to consider when to pull that back or even to deny those consumptive use permits. So getting a better understanding of how much water we're pumping out, tracking how much people are pulling out with wells is another issue. So improving our wastewater and water infrastructure, it's aging, a lot of that is we're losing water there. It's also causing some environmental harm getting into our creeks. Uh, so focusing on that, increasing getting water back into the ground. I, I, I'm sure everyone here knows we get our water from underneath us in the, in the aquifer. We need to have strategies to get clean water back there as much as we can. And again, improve the current and existing budget regulations to, to move us in this direction. We look at natural resources. These are the areas that are providing um, ecological services for us. They're doing the work of pulling in greenhouse gases, releasing oxygen, keeping our temperatures cool, uh, helping us with flooding. Focusing on these areas and identifying where that those ecological resources are, are at their best, we need to be protecting those areas. So we, again, we talked about the forest management plan, that is gonna be a major uh, tool we're gonna to use to assess what we wanna do moving forward in the area of tree protection. We wanna improve our tree protection and, and, our, and look at our targets of how much canopy we want and need in our community. We wanna to continue to protect our wetlands and floodplains. Again, that is where the water goes when we get these big storms. We build on those areas, the water's still gonna go there, and 10, 15 years from now, we'll, we'll all be paying for having those homes removed from those areas. Um, the 30 by 30 plan is a major component uh, moving us forward. And we wanna improve existing development and landscape requirements to promote that um, resilient landscaping strategy and to support more sustainable uh, practices both in landscaping as well as in agriculture and uh, I think our agricultural protection strategy is in place to help us move us forward with, with agriculture protection. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, mental health and health as it relates to climate. Uh, I don't think I need to to go over these but as, as we all talked about I think everyone here has probably experienced climate anxiety or maybe referred to as sometimes eco anxiety. Um, the feeling of hopelessness and loss. I just want to say we have what I believe is the best crisis center in, in the country. It's the first one in Florida, I believe, and they are our phone number away. So that's the phone number. If you have any kind of crisis and you need help, please contact that num number. It's 24-7. And that group has continued to provide a service to this community to help us address our mental health challenges, and they will help you with any of these issues listed here. Um, we are also working together with the crisis center so that they get a better understanding of the impacts of climate on our community. So they're getting trained to understand that, that interaction between these experiences we have with climate, like heat and storms, and to, and by the way, they're, they're the ones you call too when we do have a hurricane, they're the hotline, they're the people answering the phones, letting you know where to get information. Um, they're joining organizations so that they can learn more about how to understand um, how climate is impacting uh, the community and how to communicate that message. Um, they're, they're a part of the conversation around homelessness and mental health impacts. The people, a lot of the people that are gonna come here because of climate are gonna come under economic crisis. They're leaving areas where they may have to abandon their home because they weren't insured. They may come with very little. So um, that's gonna be a major challenge uh, addressing homelessness and, and economic impacts from, from uh, climate mining. I've got uh, two, different, two more categories to go and talk a little bit about agriculture and food security. We're looking at this in a very holistic approach. We're not just looking at the production of food, um, 
But we have we have a, a very successful small farmers grant program where we're assisting farmers that are often you know, 40 acres or smaller with small loans to keep their their farms going or making their farms more sustainable. Um, we've got a certification safety food certification program. Like I mentioned earlier, promoting community gardens. There's a lot going on in the area to help our local farmers. Um, they're, it, after um, tourism, our, our ag community is our second best, uh, biggest economic driver in Orange County. Uh, processing and, and distribution of food is, is really critical to getting food to those who need it. So we have food hubs, uh, the Good Food Purchasing Program, uh, we're promoting agritourism and supporting food incubators. We're looking at the health and, and, and well-being of our citizens. We're trying to also encourage the Green Jobs Pipeline. This includes like our youth culinary program and other programs to get um, our, our high schoolers and our college students into positions that are going to be very important as we tackle these climate crises. Focusing on helping farm workers. I think it's going to be a real challenge. We already know uh, there's lots of problems there. And really try to improve our language access program. And I think we'll talk a little bit about that in the next presentation. And then finally, connecting ag and, and the environment. Um, promoting the, the agricultural easement program retains those farms, but they also help us focus on best management practices, sustainable practices in agriculture and kind of close the loop on whatever food doesn't get eaten, if we can't get it to, to the community, it gets put back into composting and recycled. So kind of a, a loop, which is a good segue into waste management. I think this is my last one. Hopefully I'm still on time. Okay. So I don't know, how many of you think we have a local municipal landfill in the county? Yeah. All we have in Alachua County are clean fill debris and uh, construction and demolition, so a very limited amount. All of our other trash gets sent 22 miles each way to a landfill in Union County. So that is a lot of, of a carbon impact being sent um, to send our waste there and back. So there's a lot of strategies we're doing um, to try to reduce how much we put into landfill through our recycling programs, we, we're trying to reach a zero waste uh, effort where we can hopefully get to a point where we have very little waste so there's a circular economy in our waste programming. And to accomplish that, we, we want to decrease how much pounds per person we use. Right now, we average 5.5 pounds per person per day in our waste. Imagine, we, in, I used to do this in college, they made me carry my waste for a week, did anyone else do that? Um, yeah, by the end of the week, it was a big bag, and, and you really wanted to find ways to reduce it, but we were forced to carry that garbage to each of our classes. 5.5 pounds is a lot, it's pretty heavy. Imagine by the end of the week, you know, you're at 35 to 40 pounds of garbage. Um, so we need to reduce that, and one of our strategies by 2040 to get to about four pounds we want to divert 90% of our waste by 2040. We want to increase our recycling rates um, from about 57% now to 65% by 2030. We want to decrease the contamination of our recycling in half. So right now, um, about 13% of the recycling materials you throw in your bin don't get recycled because they're contaminated with things that shouldn't be in there. That 30% is actually a pretty good number if you look at the state average, but we want to get to about 6.5%. So we're sending 200,000 tons per year to that landfill. We need to do what we can to reduce that. It's not only dealing with the waste issue, how much carbon is being released from those trucks that are going every day to the landfill. So I'll, I'll finish up now with with some next steps. There's a lot more next steps than just here, but these are kind of some of the big ones. So what we're hoping to do, we're about to go into breakouts after the next presentation, is get your feedback, your ideas, your suggestions. No idea is a bad one. Write it down, get it to us, and we'll, we'll keep track of that. So we do have some cards. Um, we also have the Mentimeter that you can write in your ideas on as well. 
We're going to take the information we received today, as well as from any other chance we have to communicate with you all, and start to finalize those chapters. Starting in January, we're going to be bringing chapters to our Citizen Climate Advisory Committee to kind of tear apart, spit out, and, and improve. Um, those are great opportunities for everyone to come out and, and attend those meetings. We're going to try, it's a big effort, we're going to try to bring three chapters a month um, to get through those nine chapters by, by April or May. Um, and that way we can clean those up and get them back to our county commission. We're hoping to do a workshop with the commission and then um, if we, we're at a point, the community likes what we have in place, we're looking to adopt it, I'll bet the earliest would be February of 2025. So that, that is it. We, we are gonna do a, a Mentimeter question, but we're gonna do it after uh, Betsy. Uh, Bet I'll let you use that. But Betsy basically gonna be talking about our community engagement, which is part of our question. So we'll we'll have a couple questions for everyone after Betsy speaks. Thank you. He did on the um, country communications uh, breakout session. And one of the things we we'll talked about there is uh, this is a global problem, but we said focus on community level solutions. I think you saw right there a lot of those community level solutions. And you're hearing uh, about more than that. Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Betsy Riley, who has served as the sustainability manager with the county's environmental protection department since August 2022. Social scientist by trade, Dr. Riley served as a federal employee for five years with the U.S. Geological Survey and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and as a federal contractor with NOAA for one. Welcome. Raise your hand if you need a copy of the presentation, and I'll bring them out. Thank you. If it's in the one you got when you yeah. came in, but in case you didn't get one. Are you aware and comfortable with the fact that a community of people may be moving to Alachua County in the coming years due to climate impact? I am conscious of the fact that there are people that will move to our community. Um, from other areas in Florida and across the nation. Uh, well, I tell you, when it's this warm in November, it does bother me because I think of the ecosystem and the way it was supposed to be and that winter comes and it kills off certain bugs and all of those things. And so that you're ready now to go into the spring for things coming new and born. No, we got enough people. <laughs> I mean, look at all these places. What? Sound like the wood right there. We're going to fill them up with houses, more polluters, more garbage to pick up, more landfill, bring in more people. No. We are not comfortable with that. Um, we have a beautiful slice of real Florida left here, and um, we really we love to share it, um, but we don't want to lose it. I'm absolutely open to planting native plants in my yard. Uh, it, I didn't know that that would help um, uh, curtail the effects of flooding. Resources in terms of food, I think that we can push a little harder for outdoor experiences such that people will grow more. My biggest hope would be that um, we could all get on the same page um, so conversations could be had that we're making progress instead of um, becoming an argument. I hope that we can get the word out as in going into neighborhoods who need to see it. We can't expect to have um, a big event about the climate and just do it in a central area on the other side of town. You're going to have to ask the pastors, can you set up a time? Can we come to your church? Uh, can we go to your, client, your neighborhood? Can we do the things to really talk? Down to earth talk. Can we just pull out the stop and say, uh, I know that you're not doing that yet. Tell me why you're not, and what can we do to make it possible?
as a teaser, um, we did interviews with 10 individuals around Alaska County now. Um, this was funded by the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, so it was a grant funded initiative. And uh, the goal was to hear climate stories from the climate, our climate vulnerable residents, uh, people that aren't necessarily showing up to meetings, um, to hear to hear from everybody in the community. So um, that is going to be available. Um, we'll be able to see more. Uh, through our partnership with the Matheson Museum. Um, they are going to be bringing all of the interviews together as a digital exhibit. Um, I heard today, some rumors it might be uh, late 2024, um, in December next month, but I, I'm gonna hedge and say early 2025. Um, we'll definitely make that announcement when it happens. Um, but that's been a great initiative. Uh, Grace to Overcome has been our lead on getting, making that happen. Um, and it, it's a, a different way that we're approaching bringing these sort of uh, less uh, less active members of our community into the climate conversation and get their voices to the, the communities that are uh, active in climate change. Um, the goal of this community engagement has been this question. So how do we ensure climate action planning encompasses all of Latchford County's residents? We are delighted to have you here today. Um, we're always delighted to have new leaders of checkers that are really making a difference in climate and climate policy. We're not necessarily the most vulnerable residents. Uh, a few people know a tree fell at my house uh, during Hurricane Helene. I never slept a single night in an unsafe place. I never missed a meal. Um, and so even though it's been really, really tough, like most people in this room have levels of resiliency that allow us to cope with what climate change can throw at us. And our goal of this piece of community engagement was to hear from those who don't. Um, this was made possible because the, um, the county adopted a new community engagement plan in 2023 and let us actually engage directly with local organizations, with, uh, community representatives who have already built trust and rapport within the county. Um, and so we worked with these local organizations to address our climate vulnerable communities. Um, those are two criteria. Um, our climate vulnerability analysis identified them as high risk of experiencing climate impacts. And two, we haven't heard from them. Um, no judgment or explanation, we just haven't. Um, and so our goal was to take a little bit of time, work with organizations that are already, already working with people that are at high risk um, of experiencing these climate impacts and hear from them. Um, these were the, the climate vulnerability characteristics that we identified from the climate um, vulnerability analysis. I don't want to spend too long on them, but uh, they're who we might suspect. So low-income communities with aging infrastructure, especially historically marginalized, um, people who are marginalized due to physical, social, linguistic abilities, that can include our seniors. Um, younger generations, um, members of the ad community, we know that they're getting impacted, they don't have a chapter, and they're not necessarily showing up at our climate meetings. And then finally, members of our rural communities and small cities. Um, so, we, we have heard back now from four out of the five organizations. Um, the first one we talked to was residents of the Spring Hill, Duval, Lake Forest, and several other historically black communities. Um, they, as you can imagine, uh, this they were a much higher percentage of black community members than some of our other survey participants. This is what we heard um, when we asked them, what are the major concerns that you have about climate change? Um, heat came across very loudly. Um, cost resource access um, and community, uh, the impact that it was gonna have on the people in their community came through um, as a very, as, as an open-ended question. But what are they concerned about? Um, a few more details, they did, the top five areas of concern was just resource access. We know the resources are there, we don't necessarily, they, these communities are concerned that they're not gonna get them. Um, heat is the next one. Cost and affordability are a, a, the third, followed by the concern for the environment and concern for energy. 42% uh, don't know where to go uh, if there's an environmental emergency. They just don't know if it's too hot, if um, the storm blows, blows through a window, they're not sure where to go. 
And then um, when we ask them, what is it that your communities need? Way at the top, mentioned 31 times next to 14, number two was just better access to information and experts. Um, people want to know, they want good information, they don't feel like they have it right now. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's actionable. Our next survey was the Rural Women's Health Project. Um, these were uh, typically English second language or limited English um, or, or no English um, re residents from di three different countries responded, eight different languages were represented, um, and uh, most 53% work outside. So um, uh, agriculture and construction were the most common, um, and cleaning being one of the most common inside jobs. Heat again. Um, we also see that a lot of their concern about heat is tied up in their jobs. Um, work came out really, really clearly too. We see field, we see disease in there. A lot of what we heard from these residents uh, was that it was gonna, they, they weren't sure what work was even gonna look like uh, if they didn't have, if heat became too extreme and they were injured. Um, 80% do not know where to find information in their language if there's an emergency, an environmental emergency. So take a second to think about that. They are um, living in um, a, a location where they there's a storm coming, Hurricane Helene is battling down the, down the door, and they have no idea where to even find information that can help them make decisions. Um, for those, that 20% that do know, these are their top locations, they come to us. They come to the county, they come to the local authorities. Next is social media, next is churches, next is Project Salute, which is the Rural Women's Health Project Initiative. Um, but if it happens, almost 50%, almost half, have absolutely no idea uh, emergency plans for what they're gonna do in the case of a climate emergency. That's something that we can help with. Um, going back to Vivian Tyler's interview, there are, we can go into communities and have conversations about um, what a plan could look like given people's circumstances. So it's it's not just good to know, it's actually actionable information for climate planning. Okay, the next was the St. Peter St. Paul uh, Community Council of Archer. Um, the, this, this group opted to do primarily yes, no electric scale questions, so I don't have a work plan for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we didn't collect demographic data, um, but the focus was on small cities in the rural areas in Alachua County. Um, Results here show 30% from being unprepared in the event of an emergency, if they're displaced, only 6% report feeling fully prepared. So our rural areas don't necessarily have a plan. Um, that might be because there, there's not a clear information or not a good location for them to go to. 83% though would like to know more. Um, so we're seeing this sort of consistently access to information, access to information. And then, um, Finally, what effect do you think uh, the changes in temperature on Earth will have on our food supply and distribution for farming and rural communities? 60% are very concerned. Okay, and finally, Flourish Farms. Um, this was a this was 70% self-identified farmers. So this was our attempt to reach out to the agricultural community, and I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, we did do some. Uh, information, as you can see, heat actually didn't pop out with our farmers the way the other ones did, in large part because they have a lot of other concerns as well. Um, this one was, how do you think it's gonna impact farming in the future? Take, <laughs> take action now. Take care of our land, take care of our farmers. And at the top, they're more expensive. 68% um, report already facing challenges implementing their kind of land farming practices. Um, they have experienced uh, change in rainfall, drought, crop failures, heat waves, other concerns that they've had. This is already affecting farming operations in Alachua County. And, the, and Flourish Farms asked, what is it that government we can do to help, since this is climate action plan focused? But promote sustainable farming, fantastic. Uh, this is one of the things that are already incorporated into our climate action plan. Financial incentives, we have small farmer grants. Um, research and technology, a little harder uh, on our budget level, um, but it's not good to know that that's a, uh, a priority. And then climate, resilient infrastructure. Um, finally, we have one more incoming, Risk Overcome. Uh, they also helped us with our video, if you'll remember, so they've been very busy. Um, and we, we are reaching out to K-12 kids 
um, an emphasis for kids in Cook and rural areas, and we'll have some results on that hopefully very soon. And then look at you guys are here. Um, so when you all responded to your survey, we asked you the same question. We said, um, how concerned are you about the following issues in Alaska County as they relate to climate change? Um, climate mitigation came to the top. So it makes a lot of sense for people that will come to an event like this. Um, also, interesting that it's that is a very different response um, than what we're seeing for some of our vulnerable communities. And it makes sense. Everybody plays different roles in this conversation. Um, but it's it's um, important to see how our sort of perception of what the top issues are is a little bit different from the people that are living in places that are going to be have some of the most impacted and the most vulnerable. So I just wanted to raise that as well. And um, with that, do we want to then to your the line and then do Denise? Okay. Yes, we're getting closer. So who would like more information? Thank you. All right, so if you would like to rejoin the Mentimeter, we um, look to collect some more data on, now that you've heard a little bit more about the Climate Action Plan, get your reactions to what you think about it so far. So this first question is asking you to rate the Climate Action Plan um, from one being poor, three being satisfactory, five being excellent, in the following areas. So the first being, is it ambitious enough? How ambitious are its goals? Is the implementation strategy clear? Is there a focus on community engagement? Is there an emphasis on equity and environmental justice? And finally, um, whether or not it covers a broad range of environmental issues. I'll give folks just a few seconds to chime in. And in the breakout sessions um, that are coming soon, you'll have an opportunity to elaborate on um, some of the reasons behind changing your reading as well. All right, thank you. We'll go ahead and go to our next question. It goes too far. All right, what key elements are missing from the climate action plan, at least based on what you've seen so far? right now all these results are recorded and we'll go back to the county to make sure that they're getting their feedback all right to keep us on time i'm going to move us to our next question what concerns do you have about the feasibility of the climate action plan and you can select all the apply here
Thank you all for these great suggestions. It looks like we've gotten to get close to all of them. That is, I've gone too fast for some of these. We'll have other opportunities for you to provide the same feedback. So I apologize if I'm going too fast. I just want to keep us on track. We have one more question, or set of questions for you. Which of the following would make you more likely to participate in the, the plan's initiatives? Would it be things like incentives, so rebates or grants, more clear to make communication like we just heard about, opportunities for direct involvement, collaboration with local organizations, other or none of these? Looks like we're hearing similarly to the results um, that Betsy shared that uh, clear communication and information is going to be key. Uh, well, last but not least, um, if you had other ideas for increasing participation, we would love to hear them. And this is our last question for this segment, so I can actually leave this one open. Um, most of you can answer while we get ready for the next thing. contributors to the city's carbon footprint are energy consumption, transportation, and waste. 
the 2019 Inventory of Community and Government Operations Greenhouse Gas Emissions report provides a detailed estimate of greenhouse gas emissions for that year, covering both community-wide activities and government operations. It's available on the city's climate action page. And this report serves as a baseline to evaluate the effectiveness of strategic initiatives designed to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. As part of the climate resiliency plan, the city is updating it, the greenhouse gas inventory as we speak to track progress and ensure continued improvement. Um, the vulnerability assessment in 2022, the city city conducted a citywide vulnerability assessment followed by a cabin-wide assessment in 2023. An updated citywide vulnerability assessment is currently underway, focusing on critical assets at risk of flooding with funding provided by the Fort Department of Environmental Protection. The 2022 citywide vulnerability assessment outlines changeable climate risks, emphasizing significant temperature increases and changes in precipitation patterns across, observed across Florida. It's available online, again, at the city's climate action page. Um, the report helps pinpoint the city's most vulnerable areas and plans to develop the development of targeted adaptation strategies. And this is how um, those two play into um, our climate action. To address the challenges identified in the greenhouse gas inventory and the vulnerability and analysis, 10 specialized groups have been established within two different two tracks. Our mitigation groups, which start with the transportation electrification plan, promoting electric vehicles and enhancing the city fleet with low emission options. Energy, implementing renewable energy sources and providing um, energy efficiency, zero waste, advancing recycling, composting, and waste reduction initiatives, waste wa water and wastewater, reducing water usage and improving wastewater management, and green purchasing, encouraging sustainable procurement practices. And then our adaptation groups, these five groups aim to enhance community resilience, got extreme heat, but also strategies food systems, ensuring food security and um, reducing food waste, equitable community engagement involving all community members in the planning and implementation process to ensure fair representation and inclusive decision making, funding resources allocation, securing and managing funds for climate initiatives, and smart technology dashboards, monitoring and reporting climate related data using advanced visual tools and uh, analyze and display information on climate metrics and progress for sustainable progress. And these are 10 chapters aligned with the UN, um, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, emphasizing the interconnectedness of the climate challenges and sustainable development. Peace to the sustainable development goals integrated into the plan include zero hunger, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, climate action, um, life on land, peace, justice, and strong institutions and partnerships for goals. Gainesville's climate resiliency plan intricately linked to the city's strategic goals. Gainesville's strategic goals are equitable community, ensuring that all neighbors have access to essential services and opportunities. This aligns with Gainesville's climate resiliency efforts to engage the community equitably and ensure that vulnerable populations are protected from climate impacts. More sustainable community, growing sustainable sustainability in all aspects of city planning planning and operations. This is directly connected to Gainesville's effort in energy, water, and wastewater management to reduce the environmental footprint, 
great place to live and experience, enhancing their quality of life for all neighbors through sustainable development and redevelopment. Gainesville's climate action initiatives aim to create a local, healthy environment for green spaces and clean air, a resilient local economy, build a strong, diverse economy that can sustain climate impact, focus on green jobs and sustained employment perspectives, supports economic resilience, invest in class neighbor services, providing excellent services to neighbors, including efficient and sustainable public services. This includes initiatives on transportation and public infrastructure that contribute to a more sustainable city. Are you guys sick of me telling you what to do? Yes. Try living with me. <laughs> All right, so we've gotten a lot of great feedback from the Mentimeter, but we also want to hear from you in conversations. There's nothing like discussions that help us really figure out where we need to go. So if we're interested in learning more about that skill set, you should check out Nurly. And then you get to spend time with John. N-R-L-I, Natural Resources Leadership Institute. And I'm going to just turn it over to you. You can tell us a little bit more about what you do. Thank you so much, Stacey. As Stacey mentioned, my name is John Day, I'm a faculty member at the University of Florida, and just volunteering to help out today because I think this is just such a great thing. So there were three objectives for this event. One was to share information about the plan. You heard a lot of information about climate change and about the draft plan. The second was to build community, to have a bunch of people who are interested and concerned about these issues get together and talk to each other and meet each other. And the third objective is to obtain input. Okay. And you all heard about the plan and the county would like to get your input on that plan, what your reactions were. That's what these breakout groups were for. And I'm gonna have each group come up, a representative from each group come up and summarize their, um, their, their, their group's discussions. In some cases, the groups narrowed down and said, here are the two or three points we wanted to make. In other, uh, other, other groups, they didn't, they didn't do that. It was more of a general discussion. I'm gonna just go in order of the groups on my list. So could I have the representative from the energy group come on up, please? They could, hi, come on up and, and, and fill us in on, on your group. And I'm gonna ask each one to be fairly succinct. I know there was a lot discussed, but if you can try to do this in three to five minutes, that'd be possible. The top two points -ish. Okay. Hi, uh, Betsy Riley. I was in the energy group, um, and we had a couple ideas come out. One was the value of good data. So um, a lot of people were appreciative of seeing the good data. They wanted to see more good data. Um, it was helpful to have things like percentages and numbers. Uh, the other was a desire to incorporate storytelling. So sort of the flip side of the data was we need to also tell a story. Could, could you slow down a little bit? Some people are having trouble hearing. Thank you. To also tell a good story. Um, so not just data and numbers, but um, helping people understand what the data and numbers were saying. Um, the, and then I guess the third thing would be the value of equity and outreach, and specifically like proactive outreach. So making sure that we're able to communicate with a really broad audience and um, use, use language, use concepts, use storytelling that kind of speak to people and bring people into those conversations. What was the second one? The second one was uh, incorporating storytelling. Storytelling? Right. Okay. So what, the number one was really good data, number two was incorporating storytelling, and number three was uh, proactive outreach. Thank you guys. Um, really Does anybody have any questions, uh, clarification questions? So again, it was about collecting data, it was about using storytelling more effectively, and it was about um, equity and outreach linked to equity. Questions? The storytelling is not clear. What kind of stories are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, um, I think the idea was not, or uh, David, do you want to answer that? You had yeah. Talk, right? um, so what we're beginning to realize is that people respond better and more effectively to stories uh, for rather than for example, for example. Uh, well, uh, let's just let's take Catherine Mayo. Uh, let's just Cynthia Barnett. Um, 
not easy talking stories uh, where there's um, where there's movement and a, a story. Yeah, and if I could just add to that, I think what they're getting at is we often use data and present data. And people react better to understanding the stories of somebody who's been through something or a story of something that just happened. I believe that's what they're talking about with storytelling. So different ways to convey these issues that are more compelling to people as opposed to the more academic approach. Yes, is a question? No, I just wanted to mention that there is a, a whole genre of literature called climate fiction. So there's a genre of literature called climate fiction. Cli-fi. Cli-fi. So yes, feel free to look at that. Thank you. Telling stories about the climate. It's great. So I'm going to ask, um, were there, was there a mitigation efforts group in here? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. You get to speak to us twice. So tell us about your group. Hi, guys. So our main point about being too repetitive is that we really need to work on incentivizing people to be more sustainable and to actually use the resources that we provide. For example, we talked about landscaping and getting people to use native plants and native grasses and not having to water their lawns as much. And we also talked about just kind of going along with outreach. How do we engage local leaders, the community, and also state leaders to be more proactive in climate action? I think that's it. Okay, I think that's it. So questions about how to incentivize people and how to better engage local and state leaders in these kinds of discussions. Are there any clarification questions? Um, that was a great clarification question before. I'd like to clarify, I did not pay her to talk about the new landscaping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, okay. How about the transportation group? Could the transportation group come and tell us, um, summarize your discussion? Thank you. And um, would you introduce yourself to you? Alice Moss, Transportation Planning Manager for Lago County. And we had a small but enthusiastic group. We had good discussion. We actually got right into some topics related to transit before we even remembered that we had a sheet of to-dos to address. <laughs> um, so I will hit on just two topics, things they liked so far. Um, so people appreciated the focus on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, planning and project implementation. Um, they like the idea of mixed density with transit options, and we talked about needing a critical threshold of density to actually support transit. And then a lot of talk about wanting more tree cover over the sidewalks and paths, and how bloody hot it is, and we're never going to get people to walk and bike if we don't have that shade. Um, should be included, um, interest in dedicated transit, things like tram systems. Um, a review or sort of like a reanalysis of feasibility of dedicated transit like bus rapid transit systems. Um, so in the past, somewhat recent past, it was determined to be not quite feasible for this area, but people want to have another look as we've, as we've had new development or mixed use development and density. Um, discussions that express routes on buses were better than at least nothing but local routes that stop a whole lot. So express routes that have premium transit amenities, shelters, um, real time, you know, bus arrival information. And then last is um, better coordination between our county and then other <coughs> metropolitan regions, uh, specifically an interest in getting um, rail transportation between us and major cities around us. Thank you, Allison. Are there any clarification questions about what was just presented? Um, they know what they like, the focus on bicycle infrastructure, uh, mixed density for transit, more tree cover for sidewalks and pedestrians, and then suggestions for dedicated transit feasibility, um, express routes with arrival information available and better coordination among between counties and urban areas. Great, thank you so much. Next, if I could hear uh, the representative for the mental health, the group discussed mental health. <laughs> Two of you, great. And please just quickly introduce yourselves. And... Sure. I'm Martha Monroe. I do environmental education. Uh, I'm Laura Crawley with the Electric County Crisis Center. And we have several ideas. Oh, here's a 
You start. Okay. <laughs> so our group focused a lot on what was missing as the health component. And I just want to pitch that. If there's anyone in here who has connections to a person who could help us write the chapter on health, that would be amazing. Um, our group also focused a lot on the interplay between health, uh, physical health and mental health, knowing that increased stress um, affects our health in negative ways, affects our immune system, so really just raising awareness and education around how we're being affected by climate change. Um, they all, our group also talked about the focus on uh, not just preparedness for disasters, but also the recovery efforts afterwards. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, we liked, in the plan, we liked all the crosstalk between the different components, transportation, energy, etc. What we didn't see was a recreation component, because recreation is helpful for mental health, in the land conservation component. Mm -hmm. So thinking about encouraging people to go outside, but teaching them how to do it safely, because it's going to be hotter and providing shade or trees <laughs> in those areas where people can recreate. So linking those together a little bit better. And we talked about youth and education and then wondered if the plan was gonna have an education chapter for schools to be engaged in climate action plan. So you got four things, really. But you can handle that. <laughs> Great, thank you, though. Were there any clarifications for them as they walk away into the sunset? Uh, anything that you wanted to follow up on? Okay, great. Let's go next to the social and environmental justice impact group. And we appreciate the hat on uh, this football day. And could you introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Jim Harper, concerned citizen. Um, I want to start with four things. Um, the first two are individuals. Adriana and Enrique, could you stand up? Because you were such good um, moderators for our group. And I think in terms of social justice, it's the youth. They're gonna lead us into the future. So these are the people we need. Um, we also had an acknowledgement of indigenous peoples, feeling like that was not acknowledged. And so I wanna make sure that we take a moment to reflect on the borrowed land we lived on, live on now that was cared for previously by unknown peoples. Some known, many unknown. And as a graduate of the Noki program, I need to say for myself that we're here because of fossil fuels. It's oil, gas, and coal that has been causing this crisis, and we need to remember that and talk about it. So the, th the things that our group talked about, there were, uh, <laughs> sorry, was I supposed to do that? <laughs> we loved how justice was incorporated and equity across everything. The solar plans are great. The breadth of the plan is amazing. Um, we talked about how we want UF and businesses to be more engaged. In fact, we have a project for a UF graduate student. How are we gonna evaluate the success of this program? We need an evaluator. Uh, we need outreach, we need town halls to make sure that the whole county knows all about this. And um, we're concerned, of course, about how we're going to do this in our political environment. How are we going to afford this? There's lots of social justice concerns, but I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. We have the youth on our side. Thank you. And are there any clarification questions for that group? Sounds like there's been some very rich discussions. Yes, yeah, Sophia. The, action, the document of the draft does have an indigenous acknowledgement, but if you'd like to talk to me and improve it, I would love that. Did everybody catch that? Yeah. Great. Yes, ma'am. I, I feel like also, in addition to, uh, in addition to acknowledging the contribution of indigenous people, we were acknowledging the contribution of us as Americans who came here and brought their industry and their skills and their Thank you very much. Any other? Great. So uh, I was in the costs and economics group, even though I know nothing about economics or costs. And uh, I'm just going to summarize what their key takeaways were. 
Um, so the first one was that this is a huge, complex plan. How are we going to determine what, prior what the priorities are? Linked to that, um, in terms of the, the need to, how are we going to look for state and federal funding to help with this? And I'm going to link that to what someone just mentioned in the current political context. Um, there was, uh, they wanted to, there was a good discussion about weatherization and fixed income county residents, um, both the elderly and others, and how that is something that, that needs more of a focus. And how can we make the economy speak to climate change? And by that, I believe they meant instead of seeing economics and conservation as opponents, is either or seeing it as a both and. Um, would anybody from that group like to correct me or add something that I might have missed? Yeah? I wound up in that group. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I'm Aurora from the Reflection Project. I wound up in that group because I, uh, there was no other group that was more appropriate for me to go into, which made me wonder, like, uh, about human resource, uh, uh, human creative resource management, or an infrastructure group, or places like that, which made me think maybe we're not looking to in those sectors for innovation, and that made me go, mm -hmm, could we be though? Uh, so anyway, that's what came up for me. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And if I recall correctly, you were making the distinction between recycling and repurposing. Yes. The the, the plan talks a lot about how to divert recyclable materials, but not about how to divert the thousands and thousands of pounds and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of reusable materials that are also part of the region. Great, thank you very much. Okay, our final group is the Land and Wildlife Conservation a group, and um, could you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi everyone, I'm Jenison, and Anna was the co-facilitator for our Land and Wildlife Conservation Group. And I have to, I have to say, because of how this was framed, I'm also the mother of a 16-year-old child of Nurley, the Natural Resources Management <laughs> Institute. So my son Isaac is here today. He went through me while I was in the Natural Resources Leadership Institute. He was conceived and born before I graduated. <laughs> so I'll never forget that. Sorry, Isaac. All right. So, <laughs> Yeah, I'll never forget that <laughs> <laughs> All right, we need to laugh, right? We need to laugh instead of crying. So we're dealing with heavy issues. All right, so I'm going to summarize our group. Um, and I'm going to start with, <laughs> so I'm going to start by saying, you know, the, the good things that, uh, it, it echoes a lot, that, that there's a lot of progress already been made, that there's, you know, that, that this comp plan is ambitious and already underway, that it's data driven. And in terms of the topic that our group had, the focus on um, conservation easements as a mechanism to protect ur uh, agricultural lands from urban development. Those were like high points. And now I'm going to quickly pivot to the concerns slash gaps, which mean which equate to opportunities. So the three opportunities that our group heard. Um, so the first one challenge: Are there contingency plans based on the potential policy changes in the pipeline? So that was like. Number one, you know, are there sort of plan B, C, D, E, F, depending on what happens with policy that's out of our control. Um, so the opportunity there, I'm not quite sure yet, but I'm gonna go on to number two. So number two was this ongoing challenge of this changing human behavior, and this gets to the comment about like, at the end of the day, it all comes down to human dimensions, right? And so how do we actually get a lot of talk about all the science out there that's already been done and a lot of the solutions, but at the end of the day, it's people who have to enact, you know, turn those data into solutions and we have to come together to do that. So, um, so that was number two, which is the ongoing challenge of human behavior change. And then number three, um, we framed it as, a, it was a concern one of our participants raised about the human and financial resources that are gonna be required to implement a plan of this scale and ambition and concern that, you know, do we have it? And tied to that, how do we translate these action items and the solutions into bite-sized, tangible, doable tasks that everybody in this room and our, you know, our neighbors and all of our community members can like grab onto and actually do something. 
And so that, um, I summarize that as quote unquote, like bite-sized calls to action. Um, if we can take that plan and translate it into these bite-sized calls to action and then create mechanisms for ongoing conversation and storytelling, like that that's the opportunity we saw from there. So those are our three. I don't need to hand you my phone. You can have my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Again, is there any, uh, any clarification questions or does anybody from that group want to add anything? So I would like to ask Stephen and Stacy, um, and if there's anybody else that should be doing that, to come on up and, and tell us what you've heard, what your thoughts are based on what you just heard from seven different groups who had some pretty in-depth discussions about these issues. Thanks. Hi, everyone again. It's Steve Hostetter. First of all, I am so impressed with what I'm hearing from this, this group. This is exactly why we wanted to do this. The input we're receiving from all of you is so diverse, so creative in many ways, and it brings in those messages that we need to hear about how to make this change happen. So thank you all for being here, and thank you all for taking the time and really thinking about these issues and letting us know about them, because this plan, as it was just mentioned, like how are we gonna get this done, is only gonna get done with support from the community and having you all continuing to be a voice so that if there is political change, if the community says we want it, it'll continue to happen. Um, so I first wanna say that I, I've been taking lots of notes. I don't think I can summarize it, although I really like like the last group, um, contingency plan for for political change, my point there was, if the community wants to and continues to be supportive of moving forward, we're gonna do that. So as a county and as a staff and as our political leaders, we need to make sure our message is clean and clear so that the community understands why and, um, that this is important. If we lose that link, then we're gonna lose that, we, don't want, we can't lose the support of the community or we're gonna lose this plan. Um, changing human behavior, we've all seen historically how we get that happen. It is a slow process, but as it works, it, it grows substantially. I think of the recycling strategy. When I was a kid in the 70s, there was no recycling. It, it went out. We are never going to split up our garbage into different bins. That is crazy. We did it, and now it's second nature. Putting on a, a seatbelt. We didn't even have seatbelts in the car in the 70s. But now I wouldn't think twice about putting a seatbelt on. So you can make change, it's just sometimes slow, but once it catches on, it really moves. Um, human financial resource to pull these plans together. Um, bite size, I thought that was a great suggestion, a bite size approach. Really make it clear, have good messaging, have clear demonstrations of how we're reaching these goals. I think. Letting the community know where we've accomplished something just keeps that momentum moving. Don't try to get it all done at once, it's not gonna happen and we'll lose the support of the group. So those are kind of the thoughts I had in my mind. I just have one quick thing to add that one thing that I heard in multiple groups um, was trees. It seems like that came up in several and then the behavior change and outreach and stakeholder engagement and making sure that that stakeholder is a broad stakeholder. That's all I have to add. I want to now turn it back to all of you. What I'd like you to do is turn to the table behind you, except for the ones in the back, in which case you'll look forward, I guess. And I want you to try to answer that same question. What are you taking away from these discussions? You all figured out you're a very smart group of people. It's easier than climate change. Well, find somebody to talk to. Talk She's here. Shown us 
So they're working on their plan. And the city has a plan right now that they're working on. How much meshing is going on between the two plans? Um, not too much, actually. They were written separately. Um, but we worked, I worked on some of the county's plans. They're pretty similar to the Ten We don't bite, we're, we promise. Share this with like 
one organization or group or like family members, friends that we're a part of. It's like the state, the city, a lot of effort about me to do that outreach here. And so uh, we're talking about that, and we're talking about also just like a lot of the innovation and talent at UF and you know, tapping into students that are really knowledgeable and like want to help with these things. So. Thank you. Well, I was just thinking as we were chatting, awareness is a powerful tool. And if we are aware of the contributing factors on the root, then we can implement, we can make those baby steps for change. Because honestly, well, awareness is a powerful tool. And, um, and I'm so thankful for our young people. They all game changers for good. And I was gonna say, I see that. I see in you all value. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you're here. Yeah, the group is really interesting. Have to make it quick though. Yeah, speaking of young people, <laughs> who's that? Chapter that we don't know about. There's gonna be a health chapter we don't know about. We don't know if there's an education chapter, and we think there's an opportunity for the plan to say, this is our vision for all the schools in Alachua County, mm -hmm. that they're sustainable demonstration areas for the rest of the mm -hmm. community, that they're yeah. teaching youth about climate change, mm -hmm. and using those two words together, even. <laughs> <laughs> because we can make a plan for the future, not for the current administration, for the future, um, and teach kids how to act. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stephen, but we just heard the power of youth and the idea that civil society has a major role in this, yes. right? And I think that's what we've heard a lot as well. Thank you. Um, yes. <laughs> okay, we are going to actually do some more Mentimeter questions for you. So final round. <laughs> so I think that's just about everyone. So thank you so much for weighing in. I also wanted to thank everyone who has seen the questions and comments coming in and the questions chat, and we'll leave that open until we shut down today. Um, we haven't had the chance to get to them, but they are all, again all going um, to the team, and we appreciate your feedback. And get yeah, some of those in comments, not questions, and that's totally fine. We can add some more of those in at the end. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, I'm going to turn it back over to um, over to Nathan. Thank you. Thank you. I really like that Mentimeter. It was great information that we're conveyed through it. Um, you know, that's an optimistic question. I think we should have our eyes wide open to all the challenges we have ahead, but I think that um, the thing that makes me optimistic is this people in this room. Um, the UF football game is starting. You still are all here and uh, actually participating <laughs> in, um, in shaping our future, and, and that makes me feel good, and I hope that makes all of you feel good as well. Um, let's, let's finish things off with 
as Stacy put it, one of my five favorite commissioners. Um, commissioner Ken Cornell was first elected to the Electric County Commission in 2014 and re-elected in 2018 and 2022. He's owned and operated a number of small businesses in Alaska County, and currently is a broker associate and senior vice president with Boss Art Realty. He's also served on various private and nonprofit boards, including community agency partnership programs, citizen advisory board, and the Chamber of Commerce Public Policy Board. Welcome, Commissioner Cornell. Thank you. So before I get started, I have some thank yous that I would like to make. What an incredible day. Can you give uh, everyone up on the screen here a big round of applause? So I have just a few minutes to wrap up today, and I just want to start by telling you all that you are literally in the center of the universe. Yes. <laughs> and I'm going to prove it to you with just a few words that I'm going to tell you about. Um, First of all, on behalf of the other four county commissioners, Anna Prizia, Mary Alford, Chuck Chestnut, and Mary Helen Wheeler, uh, and, and my new title, one of Stacey's five favorite county commissioners, <laughs> Ken Cornell, I want to thank you all. Um, to have five county commissioners participate in any event <laughs> says that it's important to this community because we represent each of you. Actually, you said 72% of you want us to represent each of you in the last election, so I want to thank you for that as well. Um, as local politicians, uh, it's not just us. We have many city leaders that I want to thank that participated today because we are one united county. And so for those that participated and for those that couldn't make it but understand the importance of this issue, I want to thank, thank them as well. And as your local politician, I want you to know that I hear you, loud and clear. Um, we heard some young people today talk about challenging the status quo and how we talk about climate change or climate, climate resiliency. And the two things that I learned in my breakout session that are important are this idea of protecting what we have. This idea of we're doing it and we have to take care of it because it is for our kids. But not just our kids, like Isaac, but Isaac's kids. <laughs> and then Isaac's kids' kids. And actually, um, the citizens in an issue that came before us a couple of years back said, think about it seven generations. Think about the actions that we do aren't for us. They're not for Isaac's generation, they are, but they're for seven generations. And I believe you had a board that uh, is doing that. So this issue, I'm in my third term, uh, I'm sorry my 11th year. I'm born and raised in Alaska County, if you don't know that. I'm a Twilliger, Fort Clark, Buholtz, Brainwashed, University of Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I, I left for five years to Atlanta and I missed my son's birthday party and I walked in, I told my wife, honey, I missed it. And she said, you missed it? I said, I'm never gonna miss another one, we're moving home. And I've been back here ever since. I love this community. And I look out and I see many people that love this community. And what I would say is, um, I heard today one fourth of the United States population lives on the coast. Sorry, I didn't know that. What I did know is that 73% of Florida's population lives on the coast. And what I learned in the last 45 days is many of them are coming. <laughs> They're just coming. I used to say, oh, the Florida has a thousand people moving to the state. Um, Sean said we have 76 million baby boomers that are retiring. 10,000 people a day are retiring, and a thousand of them are coming here. But it's not just the folks that are coming to Florida. It's the folks that live on our coast that want to go to a place that has three of the premier hospitals in the state, in a research hospital, a private hospital, and oh, by the way, the largest VA 
in the eight southern states. A place that has professors and PhDs that work at the University of Florida and teach and work at Santa Fe College, the number one college in. And so we are a community of close to 300,000, but I argue we have the highest intelligence in the square miles uh, in a small area than anywhere else in the country. We have you know, a top five university. And so if someone's gonna figure out how to solve these problems, they're right here. They're in this community. And many of them are actually in this room. So then I think about, well, why is this important for Florida? Like, like what, what is special about Florida? And Sean mentioned in our breakout, tying climate to the economy. So I asked ChatGPT this morning, how big is Florida's economy in the world? Let me give you some, you can take this one home. This is a good one. If Florida were a country, it'd be the 13th largest economy <laughs> in the world. Okay, let me give you some stats. Florida has a 1.7 trillion, this is as of 2024, has a 1.7 trillion dollar economy. I'm just gonna tell you a couple of them that are smaller than us. South Korea, 1.6 trillion. Russia, 1.5 trillion. Spain, 1.5 trillion. Australia, 1.5 trillion. Mexico, 1.2 trillion. Indonesia, 1.1 trillion. The Netherlands, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Switzerland. You are literally larger as an economy in this state than those countries. So in this state, we have 67 counties. I sit on the Florida Association of Counties Board of Directors. I am a subcommittee member for the National Association of Counties Environment, Energy, and Land Use. In Alachua County, we have 67 counties. How many counties are having a climate summit? I don't know of any of them. Maybe, maybe there some in South Florida. Maybe some in South Florida, okay. Um, but how many inland counties actually have an environmental protection department? One, they're all on the coast. How many, and so when I think about the leadership of the state of Florida, and I go to the state of Florida Association of County meetings, and they tell me, you know, y'all have like the best staff in the state with Steven and Ramon Gabarete and Missy Daniels and Carl Swart, and the list just goes on and on and on. We have literally some of the best staff in the entire state addressing issues that are important, not just to us as a county, but to the 13th largest economy in the world in the state of Florida. And so for that, I want to tell my staff, and I want all of you to tell our staff, thank you. Okay, so there, yeah, I think I proved it. You're in the center of the universe, you agree? <laughs> okay, so, you know, I, I, I brag about our community. I learned today that we're gonna double in size uh, in the next 75 years. I'm 56, it's gonna be my sons and their sons. I'm a new granddad three weeks ago. It's gonna be their, it's gonna be their world that we leave this to. Um, and what I will say about that is that um, it came up actually in the last session. Where's everybody going to live? Like, where are they going to live? So um, housing is going to get into this plan, okay? Education is going to get into this plan. Um, um, we can figure out these problems, and we are, no matter what happens at the state and federal level, uh, this board, I will tell you, funds its priorities. We talk about what's important, but we fund our priorities, and you had five county commissioners today, you had well over a million dollars in the last four years funded to this, this issue. Your county commission is gonna fund these problems, okay? Um, we're gonna figure out how to prioritize them. Much of that is going to come from people like you that tell us where to spend your money. Uh, and so let me just wrap this up by telling you all that when I look out, I am so hopeful. 
you know, I'm a five on that 3.6, I'm a five, okay? Because I know how smart my kids are, and I know how smart their kids are gonna be, and I know how smart this community is that is telling us county commissioners and city elected officials and the young people where to prioritize uh, our efforts. And so I'm very, very hopeful. Um, what you tell us matters. Uh, I know that even though these things are falling off the wall, that our staff is gonna scoop them all up and they're gonna summarize things and they're gonna bring us a plan uh, to adopt in the fall of 2025. And so it's gonna involve how do we protect, how do we create a community for seven generations. Right now we have a tree um, policy that says if you have a live oak that's bigger than 60 inches, you can't touch it, you can't mitigate it. It's been here longer than all of us, you can't mitigate it. I'd like to move that down. I'd like to move that down to 45 inches. But I, I need help and all our commissioners need help and we need people like you to say if that's important, we're gonna show up in those chambers and we're gonna tell you that's important. Because it's important for Isaac's kids. That's why it's important. And Isaac's kids' kids and their kids' kids. Because we can create a place that is um, both good for the economy, protects what we love, and leaves a, a place that's better than, than what we left. You know, my mom always said, okay, we're going to my friend's house, is that okay? Make sure you leave that place better than when you got there. Think about it yourself, you know? Brush your teeth before you go say good morning. You do things that are um, important. And so that's what we're gonna do. And so with that, I would uh, ask that you listen to our young folks, go home and tell one or two, oh hell, you got two neighbors? Tell them both about what happened to them. Get them engaged. Tell them that their government wants to hear from them. They are important. And let's take this step as just a step moving forward. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it on behalf of everyone in Lachlan County. I guess we're concluded. We're concluded. Thank you.